Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. Uh, tonight we are going to be getting back into the Conquest of Bread. We're on the penultimate chapter, finally. So we have this one and, and just one after that. And tonight joining me is Bree. Hello. Of the... <laughs> Hi, I'm Bree from the Dark Thoughts Project. The Dark Thoughts Project. Um, and that's a, a forthcoming podcast, as I understand it. And it's going to be on conspiracy theories. Yes. Okay. Um, any conspiracy theory in particular that, that you think you're going to lead off with or that we can expect? I'm a sucker for hollow earth theory right now. Hollow earth theory? Dive deep into hollow earth. There, there are actually people that still believe in the hollow earth. Oh, well, you, well, I mean, I shouldn't have assumed that it was a <laughs> conspiracy debunking podcast. Did no, you see the new, um, what was it? Godzilla versus Kong. I did not. No, there's a hollow earth hollow involved earth in that. Theory. That that's how that's where all these monsters come from in yep. the, that world. Wow, wow. That's Spoilers. So Jeez. All right. Well, that I, I mean that sounds like a, a pretty cool thing. Conspiracy theories are always really intriguing. It's just how people get into the mindset of following. And most of them are coming true every day. Well, I mean, obviously that now that Donald Trump has been reinstated as president like ten times over since uh, he was illegally not actually removed but put in a what was it biden was in a, a sound studio somewhere that was the, the that's the current theory biden's in a sound studio and trump is actually still at the white house because he never left it makes the most sense i mean you know check the tapes fellas <laughs> so anyway uh so we're gonna be discussing the conquest of bread tonight um are you familiar with uh, peter kropotkin at all or, or what's I'm going into this mostly blind after a brief wiki search, but, you know, you can only go so so deep into a Wikipedia before you just go through a rabbit hole. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've done that. I'm ready to be Alice, Plenty though. <laughs> just be careful which side of the mushroom you eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if you feel comfortable, how would you describe your particular political beliefs i grew up with a very conservative conservative family and growing up i thought why are, it, are everything that my parents teaching me why does it feel wrong so right now i would say progressive i think things need to get better for a lot of marginalized folks cool yeah yeah that, okay just leave it at, at progressive then yeah awesome awesome um, all right. Are you, are you ready to, to get into the, the chapter for tonight? I'm excited. All right. Well, let's do it. This is going to be uh, The Conquest of Bread. It's going to be chapter 16, as I said. The, the, the title of this chapter is The Decentralization of Industry. So this should be an interesting one. So uh, for those of you who are just coming to this now, what this book generally is about is, let me get the, the this audio screen up on here. Let's change it over to that screen there. Uh, so what this book is generally about is, is um, an ar anarcho-communist revolution and how things should proceed afterwards to make sure that you fulfill the promises of the revolution. So if you're telling people the point of this revolution is to make things more equal, um, to give people uh, everything that they need, all the basics of life, um, and and ensure that, that everyone is, is provided for, then you better follow through with that. And that better be your, your number one priority. You can't just sit around and deliberate about what the new power structure is going to be and set up all these uh, bureaucratic apparatuses. Because in the meantime, the people that actually performed your revolution for you, uh, that, that fought whatever battles there were, these people have needs right now. So the point is to the point of any revolution is to fulfill the promises of the revolution. It's not just to overthrow the current power structure, um, and it also talks about how to keep from backsliding into the old ways of doing things. So, trying uh, with with anarchy, the idea is to um, do away with unjust hierarchies. Like you, ha in order for there to be a hierarchy for any given situation, you should have to have a legitimate reason for it. Say. You're a parent and you have experience and wisdom that your child may not. So if they want to go run out in the street 
it is okay for you to stop them bodily from doing that, obviously. Um, however, if you uh, just happen to be in a good place in your life, uh, you happen to have uh, an inheritance or something like that, and, and you find that you can set up a business and basically make money off of your access, your, your you know, controlled access to the means of production, which is, which is how your business makes money, um, you can just take whatever profit comes into your, your uh, business and redistribute it as you see fit, giving as little as possible to your workers. That is seen as an unjust hierarchy. So we're trying to do away with those things. Um, work towards more like worker on cooperatives and that sort of thing, where everyone gets a democratic say. So it's about injecting democracy and, and freedom into all aspects of life and about making sure that everyone has the basics so that we can all reach our highest and, and best potentials, basically. Do you have any, any questions before we start? Any? No, that was very well said. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it's been many weeks now with this book, so... I feel like I'm, I'm finally getting the, the rhythm of, of Kropotkin's style and the way he lays things out. Um, so yeah, let, let's get into the chapter and we will be, of course, pausing as usual to, you know, bring up points that, that we may have or, or try and relate it to the modern world. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. There's, there's really, there's no dumb questions um, unless you're a fascist. In that case, all your questions are dumb. But <laughs> aside from that, if, if, you are, if you are going to operate in good faith, even if you disagree with whatever's being said, uh, please feel free to, to ask questions about it or, or make points about it. Um, I always welcome that sort of an honest uh, uh, good faith dialogue. So here we go. Chapter 16, The Conquest of Red. Production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Oh, and I'm going to turn on the closed captioning. Thank you. The Conquest of Red think, by Peter Kropotkin. I think this, this guy has... Uh, a fairly clear voice, uh, but already the Congress are read by Pepita Kropotkin. Not a, not exactly going to come always come through, um, so I'll, I'll do my best to correct the, the the closed captioning if it's wrong. Hopefully, you have closed captioning also turned on on Twitch. Um, I, I don't know how actually know how well Twitch does at that, but but hopefully it's better. But if if something comes through and it's 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 wonky and it doesn't make sense to you, you know, go ahead and, and throw up a question and I'll I'll try and correct it. Um, so yeah, the conquest of bread by Pepita. <laughs> Chapter sixteen. The decentralization of industry. I'm gonna bump up the volume a Part little one. bit. After the Napoleonic Wars, kind of Britain all but succeeded in ruining yeah, the main industries more. which had sprung up in France at the end of the preceding century. She became also mistress of the seas and had no Tell rival of importance. Guys, she took into the situation and knew how to turn its privileges and advantages to account. She established an industrial monopoly and, imposing upon her neighbors her prices for the goods she alone could manufacture, accumulated riches upon riches. But as the middle-class revolution of the 18th century abolished serfdom and created a proletariat in France, industry, hampered for a time in its flight, soared again, and from the second half of the 19th century France ceased to be a tributary of England for manufactured goods. Today she too has grown into a nation with an export trade. She sells far more than 60 million pounds worth of manufactured goods, and two-thirds of these goods are fabrics. The number of Frenchmen working for export or living by their foreign trade is estimated at three millions. France is therefore no longer England's tributary. In turn, she has striven to monopolize certain branches of foreign industry, such as silk and ready-made cloths, and has reaped immense profits therefrom. But she is on the point of losing the monopoly forever, as England is on the point of losing the monopoly of cotton goods. Traveling eastwards, industry has reached Germany, Fifty years ago, Germany was a tributary of England and France for most manufactured commodities in the higher branches of industry. It is no longer so. In the course of the last 45 years... Okay, so, so if all this talk of industry is a bit confusing, um, especially because it, it no longer applies to the modern day, uh, I think all he's trying to establish here is that we've gone from one giant superpower in, 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 the, in the past, in the, the 1700s, uh, being England... Um, you know, stretching its, its empire all around the world, 
pulling in goods and, and, and people from all over the place and, and building its, its manufacturing empire. It's, it's now moved out so there's centers of trade in Germany and France and, and so on and so on. So I think what he's trying to establish is that there's, there's just a natural decentralization as, as places uh, become richer through the, the trade that they do. Um, I think we can still find that true today, like even the places that the U.S. relies on for, for cheap trade. Um, we tend to keep having to look for newer and newer markets because they eventually start demanding, you know, labor rights and, and stuff like that. And like, oh no. yeah, I know it's, it's such a tragedy for the American businessman. Well, won't, won't anyone think of the poor businessman? Um, so capitalism has, has that tendency to, it, it both, it, it, you know, we have, we have to admit that it does benefit people as compared to, um, a super centralized, uh, system of like, serfdom um but at the same time it, it has to keep finding new markets to exploit and new people to exploit do you have anything you like to add to that or you just want to keep going through all this these... i'm learning as okay. we're going no, no, that's yeah. totally fine um so yeah so he's just kind of describing his world and, and as it's changing here and especially since the franco-german war germany has completely reorganized her industry new factories are stocked with the best machinery the latest creation of industrial art and cotton goods from Manchester, or in soaks from Lyons, etc., are now realized in recent German factories. It took two or three generations of workers at Lyons and Manchester to construct the modern machinery, but Germany adopted it in its perfect state. Technical schools, adapted to the needs of industry, supply the factories with an army of intelligent workmen, practicing engineers, who can work with hand and brain. German industry starts at the point which was only reached by Manchester's and Lyon after 50 years of groping in the dark, of exertion and experiments. It follows that as Germany manufactures as well at home, she diminishes her imports from France and England year by year. She has not only become their rival in manufactured goods in Asia and in Africa, but also in London and in Paris. Short-sighted people may cry out against the Frankfurt Treaty, they may explain German competition by little differences in railway tariff. They may linger on the petty side of questions and neglect great historical facts. But it is nonetheless clear that the main industries, formerly in the hands of England and France, have progressed eastward. And in Germany, they found a country, young, full of energy, possessing an intelligent middle class, and eager in its turn to enrich itself by foreign trade. While Germany freed itself from subjection to France and England, manufactured her own cotton cloth, constructed her own machines, in fact manufactured all commodities, the main industries took also root in Russia, where the development of manufacture is the more surprising as it sprang up but yesterday. At the time of the abolition of serfdom in 1861, Russia hardly had any factories. Everything they needed, machines, rails, railway engines, rich materials, came from the West. Twenty years later, she possessed already 85,000 factories, and the goods from these factories had increased fourfold in value. The old machinery was superseded, and now nearly all the steel in use in Russia, three-quarters of the iron, two-thirds of the coal, all railway engines, railway carriages, rails, nearly all steamers are made in Russia. Russia, destined, so wrote economists, to remain an agricultural territory, so this is kind of tedious. Um, not a lot of this has really much relevance to today. <laughs> I apologize for this long passage here. Um, yeah, he's just really trying to drive home the point that things move from one place and then there's many centers of industry. So we're just probably going to just get through this part and we'll see if... Has rapidly developed. I mean, I haven't read this chapter in quite a while, so it may not pick up, and we may be able to just go on to the next chapter after all, but we'll see how it goes. ...developed into a manufacturing country. She orders hardly anything from England, and very little from Germany. Economists hold the customs responsible for these facts, and yet cotton manufactured in Russia are sold at the same price as in London, capital taking no cognizance of fatherland. German and England capitalists, accompanied by engineers and foremen of their own nationalities, 
have introduced in Russia and in Poland manufactories, the excellence of whose goods competes with the best from England. If customs were abolished tomorrow, manufacture would only gain by it. Not long ago the British manufacturers delivered another hard blow to the imports of cloth and woolens from the West. They set up in southern and middle Russia immense wool factories, stocked with the most perfect machinery from Bradford, and already now Russia hardly imports more than a few pieces of English cloth and French woolen fabrics as samples. The main industries not only move eastward, they are spreading to the southern peninsulas. Turin ex Excavation of 1884 has already shown the progress made in Italian manufactured produce, and let us not make any mistake about it. The mutual hatred of the French and Italian middle classes has no other origin than their industrial rivalry. Spain is also becoming an industrial country. While in the east, Bohemia has suddenly sprung up to importance as a new center of manufactures, provided with perfected machinery and applying the best scientific methods. We might also mention Hungary's rapid progress in the main industries, but let us rather take Brazil as an example. Economists sentence Brazil to cultivate cotton forever, to export it in its raw state, and to receive cotton cloth from Europe in exchange. In fact, 40 years ago, Brazil had only nine wretched little cotton factories with 385 spindles. Today, there are 108 cotton mills, possessing 715,000 spindles and 26,050 looms. Okay, so, I think we get the point. They're producing more than they used to. This has been, you know, they're in the, the heart of the Industrial Revolution, which is going on, and today is basically just an extension of that, you know? And maybe it's something that's a little more relevant today. Um, I think we can relate it to something like Amazon, where over the course of the pandemic, uh, Bezos' net worth, which, you know, largely was tied to stock, but still, his net worth went up by, I don't know, how many, how many billions of dollars? Tens of billions of dollars. Um, and they produced tons of goods because people were at home, you know. It was very high demand for, for in-home delivery and that sort of thing. And then Amazon was in a prime place for that. Did you say a prime place for that? Oh, I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even do that on purpose, but yeah, good catch. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so, you know, huge ramp up in production, I'm sure. Uh, people all, you know, I'm sure they, they hired on tons of people. At the same time, how much of that increase in revenue actually went to the workers themselves. Do we know if their wages went up at all during the pandemic? I don't think that they did because it seems like they were still fighting for, for livable wages after everything was, was, was starting to wind down with the, with the vaccine and everything. So mm -hmm. as far as I know, they haven't really seen much of an increase. And yet Bezos, you know, he's, he's going to space, going to space and hopefully he will stay in space. I saw there's a petition for him to, to remain in space once he goes. Him, him, as well as Elon Musk. And Send me the link. Yeah, really. I was, I was very quick to sign that one. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was the same thing in Kropotkin's time. We have all these advances, all these huge, you know, technological breakthroughs that are allowing people to be much more productive with their time uh, in terms of the, the stuff that they're putting out and then the money they're making for their company, but really they don't see a lot, if, if anything, from that gain. And that's what we have under capitalism because the, the, basically the rulers of this, this, you know, it's essentially a private government. Um, that's, a, that's a good way of looking, especially if uh, like a really large corporation like Amazon, it basically functions like its own separate country. In fact, you could chart it on the, the, the wealthiest, you know, among the wealthiest countries in the world, just its, its revenue alone. Um, but it's, it's because it's an entirely top-down structure where the people at the top make all the decisions about where that money goes, that it doesn't matter if you produce, you know, 500 extra units in, in an hour, you see none of that because you don't have the power to decide. Yeah. That's yeah. rough. Been yeah. there. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, anyone who has not just been born with a silver spoon and gotten a, a you know, like in Trump's case, a, a small loan of $2 million to, to start your... That whole thing. And, and, you know, rights to a certain uh, a pocket of Manhattan to do real estate development. It, it, as, as long as you're not in that category, um, you've probably worked a, a job for wages. And you've probably noticed that, like, hey... You know, we're selling, you know, $10,000 worth of hamburger a day, even if you look at the, the seven twenty-five per hour, but, you know, spread out through all the employees here, it's, it's fractions of, of what's coming into the, the restaurant every day. So, so in a way, that's, 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 that's a pretty big structural inequality because it can't, there's, you know, even if you were to yourself as an individual advance in the company, Someone still has to do your job below you, so. Usually. I mean, well, usually. <laughs> in some situations, they just make you do your job and the other person's job and the mm -hmm. person who was fired long ago's job um, for the same pay that you're making now. Sure because they can. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. Um, where was I going with that? Totally lost my train of thought, but um, anyway, it doesn't matter how high you ra you rise up in the company individually. There's some. There's only so many spots that are up there, so it's not realistic to say that everyone could attain that level because you always are going to need workers in order to make that profit for yourself. There has to be someone to skim from, basically, in order to, you know, decide how much money you're going to make. Uh, based on the efforts of other people, um, so 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 people there has to be people to fill in that that bottom part. There's always someone who's going to get the the door slammed in their face, who can't rise as high because you're filling that position. So, in and then, even if you make your own business, you still need to have other people underneath you in order to make that money again. Mm. There are very rare situations where you can be an independent contractor like. You're a high-priced lawyer or, or some sort of really exclusive contractor and you work completely by yourself. You don't have any employees and stuff like that and you can still make a good, money, uh, good living. Maybe even like a plumber, like if you were just a plumber by yourself, you could potentially make a living. But there's only so much need for, for plumbers or lawyers or whatever the position is. Not everyone in society could be it, so society stays structurally unequal. Does that, does that make sense at all? You explained it really well. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You're a great teacher. Thank you. <laughs> I try. I try. So what do you do? Like, how, have you thought about what, what you would do if you did things differently? It's like, say, say you had a, a large sum of money. Mm -hmm. You can start your own business. How would you do things differently yourself? If, you, if, you, if that's um, a question you've even considered. I wouldn't do it by myself. I think I would have individuals come together to form a business. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can all be equals. Yeah. It's it's a hard thing to try to figure out because we're so used to like, you know, who's on top and who's on bottom. Exactly. We're, yeah. That that's a very good. Uh, and you know. Yeah. And now for all you conspiracy theorists out there, yeah, okay. you know, flashing that Illuminati sign. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to think in a different way because, yeah, you're right, we're, we're used to it. And, and also, we're so caught up in, in just trying to survive uh, by, by going to work, um, working long hours and being drained after work, whether it's mentally, physically, or both, that it, it's hard to really even have the energy and the time to, to consider anything different. But, but what you're talking about is basically a worker-owned cooperative. Mm -hmm. So... Minnesota has decent laws about that, but it's still something that's not easy. Like I've tried, I've looked into navigating it myself and I can barely figure out what to do. Um, it's really hard to, if you don't have a model to just come exactly, up with it. Exactly. Um, on the flip side though, if we, it, all it would take was a number of very high profile people or, or, or cooperatives to, to form do well and then help others to, to really get that ball rolling to the point where, you know, things would be building on itself uh, almost exponentially, potentially. 
um, where you get one successful cooperative, they help launch another one, which helps launch another one, so on and so on and so on, until there is that example, and then that, that, that bar to entry gets a lot lower. The road gets a lot easier. But it's just that, just that initial push that's, that, that is really hard. Um, it's like most people don't know how to, to form any sort of a business, let alone a very specific type. Mm-hmm. Important to note, though, you can, you can be legally an LLC, but still structure your company any way you like. So you can, re- you can write into the bylaws of your company that we're going to make democratic decisions about pay, benefits, working schedules, you know, workplace environment, um, and, and, and things like where the profit is going to go. You know, are we going to invest it? Are we going to distribute it among the workers? How are we going to do that? All, the, all these sorts of decisions, you could say in the bylaws of your company, this is how we're going to do it. It's going to be democratic where every full-time worker um, or every part-time worker even, everyone who is a regular worker, not just a sometimes contractor with your company, gets a say in, in all those sorts of decisions. So it's not impossible. It's also hard to get even a loan to, to start a business. Mm-hmm. It's that initial capital investment that, that's, that's really difficult to, to acquire, you know, especially if you're doing something new. Um, and if you think of, like, working class people doing this, we have rent, we have bills, and then you're also trying to, you know, create your own business with a group. Right. It, it just seems impossible. It does seem impossible. And, you know, so many of us are locked into college debt. I know I certainly am. I probably have almost a hundred thousand dollars left of, yeah, of college debt. Yeah, basically between grad school and with a degree that I don't really even I've never actually used um, specifically. I mean, I've used it for for this this show, but that you know, not yet making money at that. Um, yet. Yes. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate the optimism. Uh, so yeah, so so a lot of us are saddled with debt, and you know, they really want to make that credit easy to acquire because they know that they can lock you in and squeeze a whole bunch of extra dollars. Um, I was just reading in, in, uh, are you familiar with David Graeber at all? Have you you heard that name at all? What was the last name? Graeber. No. Okay. So he, he was a a professor of anthropology, I think at some East coast university, as I recall. Um, he's a, he's, he was a well-known anarchist. I think he died just last year. Tragically, he was, he was relatively young, but he, he came out with this book called Bullshit Jobs. And he was talking about the financialization of America's workforce, where a lot of companies, like he, he was talking about even companies like GM and, and some of these bigger old industrial companies, they don't make most of their money through sales. They make the vast majority of their money through financing. So you go to buy a car and you're paying a lot more in the long run than you would pay outright, right? You know, so so they're making money through all those payments that are coming into them. Comparatively, would that be like overdraft fees with banks? That too. Okay. Yeah, a lot of banks make a, a large chunk of their money through through fees. So um, many. Yeah, and so this creates all these jobs that that you know are creating money out of nothing, basically, just m- money because you have money. Um, oh boy, and I and I've lost my train of thought again, but that's okay. Uh, we were talking about anthropologists and David Graeber. So yes. yeah, that was the that was the Sorry. book that, that that he wrote. But I don't I don't remember exactly how I was going to write that. Anyway, we have we have a, a comment coming in from Empathy Lady. I just read an article about a guy in his late fifties who was a driver for Amazon, working hard and priding himself on doing so, who got fired because of an algorithm. Computers, no human beings, concluded that he wasn't meeting whatever benchmarks they had established uh, and you'll be able to relate to often it was because uh, he couldn't get into a locked department to deliver packages and now he's out of work and that is is really common throughout Amazon structure like they, they have especially for the people that, that, that they're called pickers basically when your am, your Amazon order comes in they have warehouses full of just maybe a hundred thousand products I, I don't know how much but but an overwhelming amount of products mm-hmm. and they're all in these different storage bins in a warehouse and 
if you've ordered several things in your order, a picker has to go through and individually pick them from each basket. And the entire time they're going, there's a clock counting on the little scanner. So it doesn't matter if they have to go to the bathroom. It doesn't matter if they, they trip and they have to put on a Band-Aid. It doesn't matter if, if the item is not in the bin that it's supposed to be. Like they'll have to go through and scan each individual item, prove yes, it's not in here. But all that, all the meantime, that, that counter keeps counting. Um, to the point where, yeah, people get fired through, through not meeting these arbitrary benchmarks that have, have basically turned them into human robots. Wow. It's insane. I guess I didn't realize that oh that gave me anxiety just thinking about having to go through having a clock like, constantly on you so like they don't even need to have managers like i've done you know gig jobs doing groceries and it's mm -hmm. on a timer but it seems more reasonable yeah and I, I don't know you just hear about all the accidents happening it's probably because these people are just running to make their quotas absolutely yeah i, I had a, a guest on a couple weeks ago, Sean from uh, uh, Tribunus Plebes uh, podcast, and, and he was talking about how he, he is himself a, a trucker, and he, he does uh, hauling, and sometimes he delivers to Amazon warehouses, and he talked about how there was a guy at one of the warehouses who, as he was unloading his, his pallets and stuff, the guy had some sort of an accident, and he like fell and hit his head, and he was bleeding and stuff like that, and everyone just kept working because they couldn't stop. Like, they were all on timers. Someone put a cone out in front of him so that other workers wouldn't... And he's like, should I call the, the, the ambulances? And he's like, no, 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 it's already been done. It's automatic. But no one stayed with the guy. You know, no one tried to come for him or, you know, check his vitals. Or... It's like, insane. Like, what dystopian teen novel did that come out of? Right. That it... doesn't... That's against human nature. I don't... Maybe just having the pressure not being able to, like, help another person... Yeah, no. it's taken all the humanity out of out of that job entirely to the point where you are literally just ones and zeros on a spreadsheet to, to some algorithm. Not even a real person is probably checking up on these people. And this, wow. this, this is the best system that's that's ever been created. It, you know, it's pulled more people out of wealth than any other thing, which is not true. But but that's beside the point. The, the idea that it's just the, the highest and best system that, that humanity could ever create. It just you look at stuff like that and you, you really gotta at least start to wonder about that mm -hmm. like did you have a point where you started doubting the official narrative of, of like consumerism or capitalism or anything like that I can't pinpoint it but I think especially after you know last year it's more apparent yeah but I don't know. It's scary. Yeah. To think that we're, I don't know, we're trying to come together with mm -hmm. all these movements, but at the same time, corporations are kind of dehumanizing people at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. How about, how about <laughs> and how about all the, the co-optation as well? You know, the, the rainbow capitalism for Pride Month and stuff like that. You oh, know? my. I think I was on... Facebook and I was scrolling through and every corporation was changing their logo back I think it was GameStop like usually it's like black white and red right it was just black and white and just like, like <laughs> just drained, we're not doing just that drained anymore. all the color out of it no more color yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, that was that was a good uh, boost to the old revenue for a little bit but move on to the next sale you know it's gonna be back to school GameStop no time. It's just it's just another holiday in the in the calendar of corporate holidays now. I don't mind Halloween. I will say that. Halloween's cool. Let's do it now. <laughs> I'm sure I'm here Amanda for would be uh, here for that as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, when a spirit Halloween pops up in like August, I know. you, you I know. know it's gonna be a better year. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of those those particular holidays where like, you know, buying a little extra is actually kind of fun you know buying a costume or assembling a costume or something like that at least you get something from it you get to be creative there's there's art and like you know personal expression involved just so many of these these holidays that corporations have latched onto are just so i don't know 
there's nothing to it. Like you push on it any little bit. And like you know, back to the the rainbow capitalism thing. Like so many of these corporations donate to really horrible politicians at the same time mm-hmm. as they're like, oh, we're proud and inclusive and stuff. And, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't bring that up too much. That's gonna hurt the third quarter sales and all that sort of thing. <sighs> anyway, let's 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 dive back into this. Are you? I think I'm gonna turn up the air conditioning just a little bit. That would be nice. Yeah, because it's uh, it's uh, it's been quite hot here lately in in Minnesota. It's I think it hit almost 88 today. So, one second. I'm gonna go turn up the air conditioning. It's just not keeping up today. There we go. Alright. Hopefully that'll help a little more. Because, man, it just been muggy. So I apologize for that. And I apologize for anyone watching uh, or listening to this later on um, for the, the the white noise of the... the air conditioner but it's kind of nice yeah is, is, is it yeah. soothing to, I, I on my end it's okay just like, just like, sh- <laughs> okay well I, I could sleep to this maybe this hope for this becoming an ASMR stream after all yes <laughs> uh, anyway so I apologize if that's distracting to anyone who's uh, listening or watching out there but really I can't be I gotta have some level of comfort so it's just gonna it's just Gonna have to be what it is until they come up with some super quiet air conditioner. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. As I was just saying, I should caveat that by saying, well, you know, a super quiet one that we can actually afford. So that that's not yet in the budget. But who knows? If 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 Uncle Joe comes through with with what did you say it was going to be up to a three thousand dollars stimulus possibly. At this point, let's we'll go of... from uncle to daddy real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Zaddy. <laughs> Zaddy Joe. <laughs> Zaddy Joe. <laughs> yeah. do uh, I hope he does something because there's a lot of people still struggling. And but all the other pandemic money that we sent out didn't go back into the economy. Yeah, you know, and, and, you, and you, you throw a, a homeless person a, a quarter and they don't become a millionaire. It's, it's strange how that works. Thank, thank you for being the, the conservative voice from the cabin. Yeah. All right. Let's continue on listening about uh, production in the 1800s. Are, are we still in Brazil? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't think it matters. I, I apologize for this chapter so far. It has been... Titillating. R- oh, yeah, yeah, titillating. Yeah. That, that, that was the word I was going to use. Mm-hmm. Not completely dull and irrelevant, but... I'm sure he'll wind up with with a, a nice summation. So, like I said, if we just blow through this uh, chapter quickly, we can get on to the next one and maybe even wrap up the book. So, let's get this which bread. total of 234 bread. million yards of textiles on the market annually. Oh, well, more even Mexico is setting about manufacturing cotton cloth instead of importing it from Europe. As to the United States, they have quite freed themselves from European tutelage and have triumphantly developed their manufacturing powers. What year is this? But it was India. Which okay, so I think it was 1894. Okay. It was right around that age, anyway. So I was like, yeah. Late 1800s, almost the turn of, of the century. So things are really starting to pick up, and there's a lot of new inventions, a lot of new inventions to come shortly after that, that really made industry go. You know, I think at this time, world population was probably around like a billion at, at most. Maybe not even quite grazing that at that point. Oh. Check now. now. Now I gotta look it up. All right. I hate that when I like almost think I have a fact and I don't quite. Let's see, world population 1895. Mm. Oh boy. Let's see if this helps. Uh, let's 
Let's see. Well, we can do eight. We can do nineteen hundred. I suppose. This is in millions. So yeah, one point six billion people, basically. At that time, so just a fraction of the population we have today. which gave the most striking proof against the specialization of national industry. We all know the theory. The great European nations need colonies, for colonies send raw material, cotton fiber, unwashed wool, spices, etc., to the motherland. And the motherland, under pretense of sending them manufactured ware, gets rid of her burnt stuffs, her machine scrap iron, and everything which she no longer has use for. It costs her little or nothing, and nonetheless the articles are sold at exorbitant prices. Such was the theory, such was the practice for a long time. In London and Manchester, fortunes were made while India was being ruined. In the India Museum in London, unheard of riches, collected in Calcutta and Bombay by English merchants, are to be seen. But other English merchants and capitalists conceived the very simple idea that it would be more expedient to exploit the natives of India by making cotton cloth in India itself than to import from 20 to 24 million pounds worth of goods annually. At first, a series of experiments ended in failure. Indian weavers, artists and experts in their own craft, could not inure themselves to factory life. The machinery sent from Liverpool was bad. The climate had to be taken into account. The merchants had to adapt themselves to new conditions, now fully observed, before British India could become the menacing rival of the motherland she is today. She now possesses 200 cotton factories, which employ about 100 and... Okay. I don't usually do this, but I think maybe we should skip ahead a little bit. Will that, will that be okay with you? Or are you just like totally riveted by all this discussion of... Indian manufacturing. It's very important. I'm sure it's important for the time. <laughs> I, um, it is interesting to see these numbers and then kind of relate them to today. We, feel free to skip it. Okay. Like. I think I, I'm just going to skip ahead because this is just I don't know. You kind of expect this sort of thing more at the beginning of a book. You know, cause we're still talking about jute mills cloth in England uh, okay, let's see. factory hand who formerly waved cotton cloth exported from England okay, we're still talking about oh, coal and iron and why should India not manufacture what should be the hindrance capital but capital goes wherever there are men poor enough to be exploited knowledge well, that is, is still true today, there's, there's, especially in other parts of the world, but, but certainly in the United States, uh, a large part of, of the you know, undocumented immigrants that, that come into this country are for seasonal labor, doing, doing um, seasonal agricultural um, work, basically, that, that Americans themselves don't want to do, at least not for the wage that they're offering. So that definitely has not changed about capitalism and manufacturing. But knowledge recognizes no national barrier. Technical skill of the worker. No. Are then Hindu workmen inferior to the 237,000 boys and girls, not 18 years old, at present working in English textile factories? Part 2. After having glanced at national industries, it would be very interesting to turn to special industries. Let us take silk, for example. Oh, we're an eminently about French product in the first half of the 19th century. An eminently French product? Soap. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to take that. Do you mean that the French use it and the rest of us are just unwashed masses, or...? Wait, was it silk or soap? I thought it said silk. Silk? Oh, I thought he said soap. Let's bring her back. Uh, special Let industry. us take silk, for example. So it's, it did come up as silk, you're right. Okay. I heard soap, though. Either way. Either, either they're 
clothing themselves or they're they're cleaning themselves. But apparently, it's not something that other yeah. people are up. An eminently to French get, product yeah. in the first half of the 19th century. We all know how Lyons became the emporium of the silk trade. We all know this, of course. At first, raw silk was gathered in southern France. Now you're right, so little by silk. little, they ordered okay. it from Italy, from Spain, from you know, Austria, from the Caucasus, and from Japan. <laughs> For the manu- just cut it out to the soap flats and just like mm-hmm. scrape up the blood. As you do. <laughs> As you do. Oh boy. Manufacture of their silk fabrics. In 1875, out of 5 million kilos of raw silk converted into stuffs in the vicinity of Lyons, there were only 400,000 kilos of French silk. But if Lyons manufactured imported silk, why should not Switzerland, Germany, Russia do as much? Silk weaving developed indeed in the villages round Zurich. Bale became a great center of the silk trade. The Caucasian administration engaged women from Marseilles and workmen from Lyons to teach Georgians the perfected rearing of silkworm and the art of converting silk into fabrics to the Caucasian peasants. Okay, so basically, all it takes is a little bit of, of instruction and people anywhere can do manufacturing. I'm just going to skip ahead again still talking about silk more about silk now we're into the clockwork monopoly this is just not the finest of chapters specialization of which economists spoke so highly in which the number of capitalists but is now of no use on the contrary it is to the advantage of every region every nation to grow their own wheat their own vegetables to manufacture all produce they consume at home. This diversity is the surest pledge of the complete development of production by mutual cooperation. Now there I think he actually has a point. Uh, he was, he's saying that you want to be able to, to rely locally as much as possible uh, because it, it helps with that, you know, it helps with mutual aid. He's really big on mutual aid. In fact, someday we'll get to his book, Mutual Aid. But uh, the idea of mutual aid is that it's it's not charity. It's it's giving people, it's finding a need and filling it if you happen to have what that need is filled by. Um, and so he's saying, I, got, I guess I gather what he's saying is that it works out a lot better if the people that you're trading with are nearby. So it's just, you know, you actually meet face to face with the people that you are giving mutual aid too so that, that could still be true today we could still have more localized food production even if we're still relying on certain things you know that we just can't get locally um, whether that's particular metals or even salt salt is not greatly available everywhere <coughs> excuse me um, more of a, a localized economy I think could be beneficial to um, kind of building up the resilience of, of cities and people so that they're not so reliant on things that could easily uh, crash, you know, if there's some sort of a natural disaster or some other shock to the system. And that also, so they're actually face to face, you tend to care more about people that you interact with on a daily basis than people that you, that you don't. So. Any thoughts about that at all? Or? It was a Hunger Games reference, so no. You can make Hunger Games reference here. That, that is allowed. I was just thinking about like the different districts oh, yeah, within like the Hunger the Games. The fishing district and the bread district. So. But they weren't all helping each other out. It was just all to the capital. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was basically the entire country was, was run as, a, as like one giant corporation. So... You might see it as, as mutual aid because the people didn't starve necessarily, or at least uh-huh. not all of them. But <laughs> it depends a, with where a, you were. Well, that's true. Yeah, but that I mean, it's a pretty bastardized version of that, and obviously a very rigid uh, caste system where there, there's absolutely no hope to, to move up or down. As far as I know, I haven't read the books. Have you read the books yourself? Oh yeah. Yeah, I I would like to. Uh, I enjoyed the movies, so. I will say. Oh my. Oh. Sorry, what was it? Ruse District um, was hmm. like agriculture, and they it was like 
black folks picking cotton and climbing trees oh, like monkeys. Geez. Oh, Slightly problematic. One of my favorites, though. Yeah? I'm black. I can say it. It's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, yeah. Okay. Cool. Like, it could have worked out if, you know, things were shared equally. Right. Yeah. So, so imagine a, a different sort of Hunger Games where... <laughs> not forced hunger and, and the pitting the poor against each other and all of these resources coming in just basically coming in as tribute like if you want to really tribute. get down to it uh, yeah the, the, the way things are set up you have an aristocracy and you have serfs that, that just work the land in exchange for I guess did they ever mention like other countries in the books or anything or is this just the last country left on, on earth I was never really clear about that they weren't told the truth for a lot of things. I suppose that's true. But suppo- you know, supposedly you're getting protection from the lords in some capacity. I, I guess they had the, well, the peacekeepers, right? The, the, the jackbooted stormtroopers with their guns. So there was order maintained. Huh? What? No. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, so imagine a, a different world where... You still have goods coming in and out of a given area, but in exchange, you get the things that you need for your life, and and the wealth is more evenly distributed, and people have a say in in the work that they do. They they you know they do things voluntarily. They aren't you know opposite of the Hunger Games. Uh, but yeah, imagine the Hunger Games, but the opposite. Okay, perfect. <laughs> it wouldn't be a dystopia. No, no, no. it would not be. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can find anything else in this chapter before we move on. The moving cause of progress. While specialization is a hindrance to progress, agriculture can only prosper in proximity to factories. And no sooner does a single factory appear than an infinite variety of other factories must spring up around, so that mutually supporting and stimulating one another by their inventions they increase their productivity. It is foolish indeed to export wheat and import flour, to export wool and import cloth, to export iron and import machinery, not only because transportation is a waste of time and money, but above all because a country with no developed industry inevitably remains behind the times in agriculture, because a country with no large factories to bring steel to a finished condition is also backward in all other industries. And lastly, because the industrial and technical capacities of the nation remain undeveloped. In the world of production, everything holds together nowadays. Cultivation of the soil is no longer possible without machinery, without great irrigation. Well, that's not technically true. Um, this, this may have been the prevailing thought at the time because, you know, there was big, big revolutions in, in agriculture. You know, they um, had machines to do a lot of the work, and, and we still do today. But there's definitely other ways of, of doing this. And I, I, I try to bring in ideas of permaculture into this stream as well. Um, and through permaculture, we can do things that, that where we more closely mimic a natural ecosystem. And in that case, even though it, 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 it makes it harder for... You know, like if you, if you have 30 different crops, say, it'd be a lot harder to have machinery because you'd have to get so much machinery, so much specialized machinery, you'd just you'd, you'd go broke trying to buy it all. Can and you go into a little more yeah. detail about permaculture? What, what specifically are you curious about? Just like what permaculture is? Or like... Yeah. So, so permaculture, uh, it, was, it was started by uh, two guys, Bill Mollison who is a, a professor in Tasmania, Australia, and his grad assistant, David Holmgren. Um, their idea, we'll, we'll just start with the, the, the term permaculture. It's supposed to be a combination of, of both permanent and agriculture and just permanent human culture, basically. Okay. So the idea is to do things in a way where you can just keep doing it generation after generation and 
more so than even just being sustainable, like the idea of being sustainable means you can just keep doing the same thing. The idea behind permaculture is to go a step further, where the more you do it, the more return you get year after year after year, assuming you set it up in a, a thoughtful way in the first place. So the idea is to work with nature instead of against nature. So it might start by selecting crops that are already suitable to your region. You know, okay. it, you know, you have so much sunlight, you have on average per year, you have so much rainfall on average per year. You start by selecting crops that, that are adapted to that. And you might go a step further and select perennial crops. Now, with your annual crops, they put out a bunch of seed every year and then they, the, the, the plant itself dies. With a perennial crop, it may die back to the roots if it's a cold area or, or, um, <coughs> or if there's like a, <coughs> a very dry season or something like that. But it will come, it'll come back to life the next growing season from those same roots. So it's the same plant year after year. All trees, as far as I know, are perennials. Things like wheat and corn and, and a lot of the staples that we rely on, uh, even like you know beans and, and peas and, and that sort of thing, those are all annuals. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem with them is you have to keep planting them year after year after year. So you're uh, constantly, if you're using machinery, you're, you're driving huge heavy things across the soil, which compacts the earth which means that you have to then drive more machines across to kind of rip it up and, and till it. And in the process, you lose topsoil and fertility, and you basically turn the whole thing into a mechanical operation where you input a bunch of, of fertilizer and you know weed killer and, and pesticide and all that sort of thing, and you pull out the finished product, and, but each time you do it, that soil gets a little bit more poor. Permaculture tries to flip that on its head, where the plants that you select work well with each other. Um, I feel like I'm throwing a whole lot of concepts out all at the same time, so stop me if I'm going too fast. What you're saying makes sense, and it makes me wonder why we're not doing it. It's hard to, to like, cognitively get, to get people to make the transition to that sort of an idea. And it's also harder because... If you're just a corn farmer, say that's how you, you've, you're, that's been your entire business. Corn, maybe you alternate it with um, a legume like, a, like soybeans or something like that, just that so you're not completely stripping out the soil every year because soybeans, uh, they're, they're oh God, I'm just getting really into the weeds. They're known as a nitrogen fixer. So nitrogen being one of the key fertilizers, they'll just take that from the atmosphere and put it into the soil, basically. So you can keep planting corn longer without totally depleting the soil. But those may be the only two crops that you grow. Mm -hmm. So all your machinery is for cultivating the, the field to be ready for that, for planting it, uh, for watering it, and later for harvesting and, and transporting and processing it. So you only have to know about those few pieces of machinery. You can just keep on doing your business a new machinery piece of machinery comes along, you adopt that one, but it's, 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 it's fairly simple. If you do permaculture instead, you have to know about a lot of different things. Um, and because you have, instead of having your entire farm be one crop, it's 30 different crops, you're just going to have, say, like, I don't know, uh, a, a patch of, say, lavender over here, which you, you harvest for, you know, whatever people use lavender for, like uh, essential oils or something like that. But it's only one little patch. It's not enough to, to need a whole big machine to do anything for, so you don't, I mean, I think that's a benefit. You don't need a machine then, but also then you have to do it by hand. So it, it takes a lot more hand cultivation um, of, of that particular crop. And then you have, you know, a grove of, say, pecans or something like that. Again, it's not enough to, to warrant a machine, so you have to do it by hand. Um, and you just keep going on and on like that. So it's a lot more hand work. But if, you, if you're really smart about how you do it, and, and you really think about the entire growing season, you can have it so, say, every week you're either planting something, if you're, if you're even going to keep on with any sort of annual crops, uh, 
or you're harvesting something. And all the plants that you choose are basically self-sufficient, except for maybe for your personal use. Like you might still have a garden with like tomatoes and stuff like that right. that still needs irrigation and, and you know, but, but basically the idea of the stuff you're doing for actual production that you're going to sell, you're not putting in anything as long as you can help it. Um, so no fertilizer, no, no watering, no biocides of any kind. Um, and as things continue along, it becomes more of a mature ecosystem. The pest problems start to balance themselves out. You have, you know, whatever predators to whatever particular pest you have, they set up residence and they keep it relatively in check. It's never going to be like a completely sterile cornfield where there's nothing living and it's just the corn. And, and so you can take the entire harvest. You may still have years where, you know, uh, your, your little patch of corn, something gets into it and that, that is shot. But you then have, you know, say 29 other crops that you can fall back on. So the idea is to have resilience as well. You're building in resilience. So, so that's resistance to shock and being completely wiped out if, if any one little thing changes. So it's, it's, I mean, it takes a lot more thought and planning and care, but you can get it to where you don't need any extra, even labor on your fields. You only plant a certain, uh, you know, enough of any one particular crop that you and whoever else lives on your land full time can harvest and manage it yourselves. Mm -hmm. So you're never overwhelmed. It's always a managed harvest or planting that's happening every single week of the year. So that's it. And, and, and then also just agricultural policy in general favors very large farms. So like, I think the average farm is like 100,000. I don't, know, I don't know if that's right, but it's, it's many, many hundreds, if not thousands of acres in America. Mm. And it's usually not even by a family farmer anymore. I think it's, it's getting up to that 50-50 mark where 50% are still family farmers, 50% are just large corporations who just hire seasonal work every year. They own all the land and you know, there's, there's no actual farmer per se. It's just, it's just another industrial business. It's industrialization brought out to the cornfield or whatever. Um, but most of the subsidies go to things like corn and soy. There's not a lot of subsidies to help you start a family farm. There's not a lot of programs to help you if you get in trouble. Um, everything policy-wise is set up to keep the system going as it is. And the system is killing our ecosystems, you know. We lose something like quarter inch of topsoil a year. I guess it depends on where you're at. Something like a quarter inch of, of topsoil. And I don't want to actually quote that because I'm not sure. Um, but we lose topsoil every year is the point. And if that happens year after year after year, eventually you're getting down to no nutrients. You know, you've mined all the nutrients out of it. Um, you just cannot keep that going that way. In addition to that, we have agricultural runoff, which causes all kinds of problems. You may have heard of uh, the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Does that ring a bell at all? Would this be related to runoffs causing um, frogs to um, the that, reproductive? I think that's a little bit, I think that's more okay. from different industries putting, chemical, putting chemicals in the water that turn the freaking frogs gay, <laughs> as, as Alex Jones says. Um, this, this is more like, you know, uh, phosphorus is, is another one of the main fertilizers. Okay. Phosphorus is one of those ones that's not in the atmosphere. It's, it's mostly within rocks. Um, it's also within bird poop so that, you know, I'm not going to get off into a huge digression, but there's, there's islands in say the Pacific where they, they mine these, these rocks that are just completely covered in bird poop so they can get the phosphorus to sell to agriculture. But anyway. So this phosphorus, they put it onto the soil in, in whatever liquid form, and then rains come through, you have a really big rain, and it washes a bunch of soil, and along with it, the, the phosphorus, into the local waterways, and along with the nitrogen and, and, and other fertilizers. 
all of that stuff gets pumped out into eventually the Gulf because, you know, half the country is, is drained by the Mississippi River, so it all ends up going into the Gulf of Mexico. Algae eat it, really, they, they, they create these gigantic blooms of algae, and then they get to a point where they've, they've used up all the oxygen doing it, and they all mass die and just filter to the bottom of the, the ocean. And they, but, but they leave behind these very low oxygen zones where anything that swims into it suffocates and dies. Just, this is all just from our agriculture. Yeah, it's... And again, I feel like I'm overwhelming you with no. too many facts um, and stuff. The first Godzilla movie, how they took down Godzilla, is they, that's kind of how they took him out. With phosphorus and I mean, it was algae? a m- mysterious <laughs> chemical that took the oxygen out of the water oh, to kill Godzilla. Oh, really? I, I guess I haven't seen that one. Was that like the, old, the, like the old school OG, like the guy in a, in a monster suit? movies at all interesting i'll have to watch that one huh took the oxygen out of the water yeah it the scariest way that i think you could die oh absolutely just yeah yeah suffocating under the ocean that would be a nightmare yeah. um godzilla is also the name of the species not just it's not just singular what yeah so there could be many godzilla monsters mm-hmm. potentially there's at least Two? Oh, really? This is, this mean, is part of the canon? Godzilla? Wasn't there like, yeah, wasn't there like a son of Godzilla or something like that, too? I haven't seen that one yet, but I was just like, is Mothra his mom? Oh. Asexual reproduction? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's I, true. The I way, have where questions. Is, where I, is Mr. or Mrs. Godzilla? Um, listen to the shout out geek history lesson about Godzilla. It was very interesting. Shout out. Oh, you're shouting out Geek History Lesson? Geek that's, History Lesson. That's the name of it? Okay. Um, sorry, that was a sidebar of a sidebar of a that's sidebar. Okay. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, if you listen to this stream uh, or podcast or, or YouTube channel, depending on how you're coming at uh, coming to this long enough, you'll know that <laughs> sidebars are our friend here. Okay. And I, I really don't mind a, a side tangent. You know, especially if we're talking about... Silk? Machinery here, you know. God, I feel like uh, I feel like I'm in Happy Gilmore in that chemistry class or that was biology class, I guess. And <laughs> have the teacher who's like trying to make the the kids. Have you seen Happy Gilmore? Or not? Or Billy Madison? Billy Madison. Jesus Christ. Billy Madison. Not They're Happy. All the same. Yeah, they are all the same. Have you Have you seen that, or is that kind of before um, your time? I think I was. I remember Big Daddy. Okay. Well, anyway, you're not missing Before much. Okay. But he's like, chlorophyll, more like borophyll. Yeah. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. I feel like uh, that's what Kropotkin is hitting us with right now. <laughs> it's machinery. More like, I don't know, nothing rhymes with machinery. But anyway. So, do you feel like you have an idea of permaculture at all? Or is that just a bunch of random, unconnected stuff that... No, that was great. And okay. I will have to say, when someone's describing something to you and they're passionate about it, it makes a huge difference. Oh, cool. Because if someone else had told me that, I would have... Not at all? Yep, yep, oh, okay. crops. Okay. But well, hopefully hopefully none of you out there have, have nodded off because of this. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. It was Permaculture. Good. So, permaculture is... If you really want to boil it down, there are three main ethics. That's that's earth care, care for the earth, mm-hmm. people care, and return the surplus to service of the first two, or fair share. Earth care, people care, fair share. So I feel that it I fits like that. really nicely into anarchist or, or even communist theory, uh, especially that last ethic of, of returning your surplus to helping other people. That fits in really nicely with concepts of mutual aid, um, with the, the phrase you may have heard before, um, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. Have you, have you come across that phrase at all? Maybe. No. It's basically the, the basis of, of communism. You know, the idea that we're going to work as like one giant team, so to speak, and we will, you know, communism tends to favor more centrally planning mm-hmm. things. So you have an, uh, an agency that collects all the wheat 
and then redistributes wheat as needed. You have an agency that, that collects all of whatever material and then redistributes it and um, so on and so forth. Anarchy, a little bit different. It's more of this spread out system where no one agency controls everything. He's really concerned about introducing hierarchies and, and people corrupting the power that they're given and, and that sort of thing. Um, so instead of any formal organization, he thinks people will just spontaneously set up groups to, to you know, organize trade, for lack of a better word. Because it's not really even trade, it's just redistribution where it's needed. So people will still do the same factory work that they've done, just that you're basically just taking money out of the equation entirely. So instead of having to, to, to pay credits at a, at a grocery store or whatever, you go and you get the things you need and you leave, basically. And because you know that, that um, or, or the, that, that grocery store knows that, that you are contributing in some different way. You may be a steel worker and instead of people buying your steel, someone says, I need steel, and you ship the steel to you. It would work very much the same way as with money, except for you just take the money out and, and people just say, I have a need. Oh, I have a thing. I'm going to fill your need with this. And this then good or ideal that society, that would, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in his estimation, it takes first overthrowing the ruling class and, and collectivizing like, yeah. every organization. So... Basically, the mechanism for, for getting to that point in his mind is that, um, yeah, you just do away with the ruling class, um, you, you seize their, their resources. Uh, if they own a factory, it's now the factory, it now belongs to the workers that, that worked there before. Um, if they owned four or five houses, you take three of them and you give them to people that need a house. Yeah. Well, I earned all my money. Yeah, earned your money it's off the backs of other property. people. <laughs> um, do you see that this being possible in our current time, though? I would have to say and who would lead very unlikely. That revolution. Right. That's, a, that's another good point. Especially when you're talking about things like the most powerful military in history. <laughs> Potentially being on the other side. So... For a conceivable revolution to work, you would definitely have to have people who are in the military on your side as well. So you'd have to win them over to your cause. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there's not much that the ruling class can do because all they can do is tell people what to do. And if they just say no, mm. they're screwed, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, it would be very difficult. It would be very difficult. So kind of the way that I conceive of it myself would be more like what we were talking about with worker cooperatives, where that's something you can still do under capitalism. You can start a worker cooperative. And in my estimation, a worker cooperative, as long as we're, we're having true democracy about these key decisions, um, is a form of socialism. So... I don't know how much I want to back up, but, but real briefly, mm -hmm. the thing that distinguishes socialism from all the other forms in the economy or all other types of economies is that you're doing away with the exploiter and exploited kind of dualism or dichotomy. So going all the way back to slavery, if slavery was the dominant form of, of your economy, you live in the South, in the United States, in, in a certain time period, most of the money is generated off of people that have a master and slave relationship. So as a slave, you have no rights, you know, you, you have to do whatever the master says under, under penalty of, of pain or death. Okay. Obvious to see the exploiter, exploited relationship there. So if you get beyond slavery, you get to the point of feudalism, where you have, instead of master and slave, you have lord and serf. Mm -hmm. 
and the serf has a little bit more rights than an actual slave. They may still toil away their entire life, they may never move up because of structural inequality, but still they can technically say, screw you, Lord, I'm, I'm going to go pledge my fealty to a different Lord. So at least you can go to a different master on your own choosing. Still, it's you have the exploiter and the Lord taking a portion of whatever the serf makes for themselves, just because they're a Lord and they have power. Moving beyond that, you get to capitalism, where you have the owner and the worker relationship. Now, this is very different from those two previous ones in that you can choose, to a certain extent, which companies you go work for. And you have a contract between yourself and your employer. Uh, the employer still, though, gets to make all the decisions about where that money goes that you are generating off of your labor. So they don't even necessarily have to work. They don't have to come into the office. They just make money primarily by owning. So they get to take a little bit of this and that and that and the more employees you have, the more you can skim for yourself. You at least have to give them enough that they don't completely starve. But other than that, you get to decide what everyone's income is, basically, just because you own. So it's harder to see, but there still is an exploiter and an exploited relationship. Now you take one step further and you get to socialism. So instead of there being any sort of owner or master or lord, everybody in the company functions as both a worker and an owner. So they each have an equal say. It's, it's like each having a, a piece of stock, but you can't buy up extra stocks and have extra power. One worker, one vote for whatever it is you're talking about. So it does away with that entire exploiter exploited relationship so we can do that today we can get we can we can legally form a worker owned cooperative and even if we don't quite structure it the way that that is required uh, to be called legally a worker owned cooperative we can still structure it on our own just you know among ourselves we can write things legally into into bylaws of how the company has to operate and give everyone a democratic say think this is purposely like you have to go through hoops just to accomplish this absolutely i'd say that that's that's almost a guarantee because a common thing among any of these systems is they try to preserve them their own structure so you know people always ask that that dumbass question you know if socialism is so great how come it's failed every time it's been tried you could ask the same thing about capitalism like at a certain point in history when uh, monarchies and, and, and various uh, types of kingdoms were the dominant form, you had upstarts, capitalists, who said, I don't want to be part of this, this system anymore. I'm, you know, usually it was, it, was, it was skilled craftspeople. You know, I'm really, really good at making wagon wheels. I don't want to pay, you know, protection tax. You know, for, forget this, this, this lord of the land. He, who does he think he is? Um, I'm going to go off and form my own guild. And, and we're going to try and separate ourselves from all the duties and, and the, the entire structure of uh, feudalism. Well, you can imagine that these, these lords and, and these, these um, aristocrats and, and monarchs were not too happy about people creating rival systems. Mm -hmm. So they would squash them again and again and again. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of times capitalism popped up and was put down violently by the dominant form at the time, which was uh, uh, serfdom, basically. Um, feudalism. Uh, so that happened with capitalism, but eventually it ended up winning out. There's now virtually no monarchies left. There's almost no feudalism left in the world, uh, at least not with any real power. Like, I mean, you could say, oh, yeah, there's still a queen of England, but is she though? Is she though? Yeah, she's basically a figurehead who's been given a lot of money to to in, instead of having power. You know, mm -hmm. they they get supported by the people. They're like the biggest. She's literally a welfare queen. You know, I mean that that there's no more literal definition of a welfare queen than someone who is a queen and only gets money because she is a queen. So, 
but yeah, there's there's for for better or worse, there's 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 basically no feudalism left because capitalism eventually won out. It gained enough power to become the dominant form. The same thing now is happening to socialism. Time and time again, you have a socialist upstart. Um, even from the beginning of the Soviet Union, like the Soviet Union had just helped win uh, World War One in like the the 19 teens, and they decided to become communist. Okay, they said we're going to become a communist nation. We're going to institute socialism as as our form of economy. On and on and on. The U.S. and a bunch of other countries immediately went and invaded the Soviet Union and tried to put down this this revolution. And you know, it didn't end up working overall. But time and time again, these 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 uh, leftist governments pop up, um, and the U.S. and other imperialists put them down so eventually if it happens enough though and if enough people start believing in the concept of more democratic free and egalitarian society there's going to be too much for capitalism to handle and it will end up being overtaken by socialism but we can start now and that's that's really the point if we can get enough people together to start any sort of cooperative it doesn't matter what it is you could be making textiles, you could be making arts, you could be uh, a cafe. That's, that's the, the kind of cooperative that I would love to make. I would love to, to form a worker-owned cooperative cafe. That's, that's kind of my dream. Um, but it doesn't really matter as long as you can get enough people, actually get the business started, and, and you know, prove yourself um, in the marketplace enough where that you can take some of your profit then to help another business another worker-owned cooperative get off the ground and if we do this enough and enough and enough i think we can get to the point where there may be still some some large companies left over but they don't have so much power that they can just make all the laws in their favor you know mm -hmm. hire a bunch of lobbyists to, to push politicians continuously to give them favors and subsidies and grants and all this, these things that that help them stay in power at the expense of every other form so that would be my plan. Just uh, I, I, I call it a small and slow revolution, which is a takeoff on one of the permaculture principles, a, which is use small and slow solutions. So in my personal opinion, that's our best bet, is, is to just start rolling the ball slowly, have it gather speed, gather size, as you know, like it's like snowballing, basically, until it's, it's, it's unstoppable. And we can just do away then at, at, you know, maybe with one fell swoop, this idea of exploiting workers for your own profit. And that means at the same time doing away with landlords because all these sort of rent seeking occupations, whether it's literally, you know, you pay me because I own something or whether it's, it's just like, um, I don't know, any, any sort of, of like bank fees or whatever it is, just having money or property and then you rent it out to someone or you loan it to someone and then you get more back. Doing away with that entire form um, is absolutely essential to get to a socialist future, basically. Because um, we're, we're talking about doing away with exploitation of each other as much as possible. You know? So that's my, <laughs> that's my very long-winded, probably roundabout well way of, of doing it. What, what do you see? Like, like have you ever dreamed of, of, of moving beyond capitalism, per se? Has, has that something that's really crossed your mind at all? Right now, the, the whole cottage core dream life sounds like heaven. Yeah. Just kind of. Just kind of leaving the, the, the bustling city behind, getting together with a bunch of people that agree with you. and Yeah. Homestead, basically. It would be really cute. That would be cute and cool, and like, there are examples of that working right now. There's there's a bunch of, they call them eco villages, um, and they tend towards more of the socialist side, where they, they collectively own certain things together. Um, I don't know of any, per se, that have actually gone like full socialist or or leftist, and completely abandoned any sort of capitalist form. But you definitely do it. I do have a question. Yeah. Would you consider um, 
more private communities like the Amish community, are mm-hmm. they example of like socialists? They're definitely more socialists for sure. Um, I know they do kind of sell to like out- outsiders. Yeah, okay. So, so I'm there's, not sure how it works there's perhaps a misconception about what socialism is or can be. Socialism doesn't necessarily mean you do away with markets completely. You may still have buying and selling goods. Not in what Kropotkin says. He wants to do away with, with, with money and, and, and all of that sort of thing entirely because he thinks that it creates hierarchies. But the, there's, you can still do socialism. You can still have worker-owned cooperatives and participate in markets and economy. You can produce goods and services and, and sell them on the market. So just because you're, you're doing a market form, market and capitalist are not interchangeable. They, they may go together. You, you, you may, maybe to call yourself a capitalist, you have to have some form of markets, but they're not exclusive to capitalism. There's always been markets. There will probably always be markets, even if it's like a black market. You know, During the Soviet Union's time, there were huge black markets for, for various goods. You know, people sold things like jeans, stuff mm-hmm. that you couldn't get or import legally into the country created black markets you know the same could be true of drugs or whatever the the current society that has control deems unacceptable you're still going to have some form of markets at the very least um so yeah so so yeah just trying to separate the two you can still have what's known as market socialism where for for everything that's beyond say food clothing um a place to live, education, healthcare, transportation, and, and say like internet or, or just communication, that sort of thing. Anything beyond those basic needs, you can sell for a profit. So, you know, if it's, if it's a um, food that you don't necessarily need, like say a latte or something like that, I guess that would be a good example. You could still sell lattes. Um, okay. There's, there's many forms that it can take, so. I didn't know that, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So, yeah. Whew, I felt like I was talking way, way too much. <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to bring up or, or interject? Like, anything that's on your mind at all, really, about any sort of leftism or anarchy? Is this, is this just still, like, a foreign concept? Or you... I'm still new to this. Yeah, yeah. But definitely leaning into it more as... You know, history gets worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as, as, as workers get left behind further and further and further. We can't even do things like raise the minimum wage in the last 15 years now, I think it's been. It's going up. 16. It's going up next week, though, right? Is it, is it going up? I think they're having a meeting. <laughs> oh, it's just a meeting. <laughs> we'll just talk about it. Still. I think this is a good idea. Still. Like... The fact that it's even gone that long, and there's like, like, I make, I make about three times minimum wage, and you know you can look around. I have a few things that that I guess you could consider extras or luxuries. I have, we've bought quite a number of plants over the years. I have a few books. You know, I have enough space for for myself and my wife. Um, in a, in a relatively secure building in a relatively secure neighborhood, I'm doing okay, but but I don't have savings. I don't have, you know, all it would take is like a say a month of, of missing paychecks, and I'd be <laughs> <laughs> not to bring up a sore subject, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how it'd be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God bless America. Yeah. But that's the, that's the thing. It's like, I should be doing pretty well, right? Three times minimum wage. That means that someone who is literally making minimum wage would have to work three separate jobs. Basically, what, uh, 120 hours a week they would have to be working at minimum wage just to get what I make doing a 40-hour week. That's insane to me. Like, the... You would have zero extra time. Mm-hmm. You'd be going from job to job to job. And like... You couldn't even schedule 
It would be yeah. It would be it would be nearly impossible to schedule three jobs. And these people, so there's, so there's people that are working, that are living on a third of what I'm 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 making. I don't know how they live. I I I, I guess they aren't really making it, you know. And we can't even pull it up to like say my level, so where they're just like, you know, at least able to pay all their bills every month, able to have a car uh, if they need one, um, able to have a computer, you know. It just, it just, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't see how we can sustain a system that allows this sort of, of thing to happen. Like, the system works for who it's supposed to work for. That's how. This, yeah, the system does work for, for who it is supposed to. Yeah. I never, I never try to say that the system is broken because I think this is exactly the way it's meant to work. It's meant to make people that have money more money. Essentially, I mean, they, 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 they try to throw these myths of like being a meritocracy in there so that, oh, you too could be a millionaire one day if you just buckle down and work hard enough and like pull yourself up, pull yourself your up which, yeah. as I've mentioned several times in this, this, this stream, the phrase pull yourself up by your bootstraps started out as a joke because literally it'd be like the cart, literally what they're talking about is do like the cartoon thing. You just grab your feet and lift them up so you're like hovering in midair. That's what that's literally what pull yourself up by your bootstraps means. It's a joke because it's impossible. You can't pull yourself up by something that's beneath you. Duh. Wow. I I didn't I know, and they've turned it into this this like, you know, thing that you, you yell at homeless people if you're a really cruel person. Um, or I guess every millennial, because we're all just entitled. Who raised us? That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Which generation would then be responsible for our predicament, if that were the case? Oh, 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 they don't take responsibility for their actions, but we're supposed to take responsibility for ours. Okay. I see how it works. We put a hole in the ozone, but, you know, the millennials and their avocado toast. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what's killing the economy. If you just put down the avocado toast and stop drinking your lattes every day well you, could you too could buy a house like I could with a quarter of my salary back in 1970 yeah the, the, the American dream that no matter and this is the original American dream not just owning this 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 on a checklist the original American dream was no matter who you are no matter where you come from if you work hard you can make it and have a good life. And even that is, is completely breaking down as we go along, as the money just keeps getting vacuumed up by the uber wealthy to the point where they have incomprehensible net worths. You can't even, you can't comprehend a billion dollars. You can't. It's, it's impossible to conceive of that. If you are making a million dollars a year Right, that's a. Th it would take you a thousand years to make a billion. A billion is a thousand millions. Yep. No one can even conceive of that timeline, and yet there are people that have over a hundred billion in net worth. And you can quibble about how oh, it's wrapped up in stocks and properties. Well, okay, give me some of that stock and property then. I'll take that instead of money. Sure. It means something. That, that has value, even if it's just on paper, that you could then transfer it to other people. Um, instead, you're trying to, to do things like, you know, <laughs> uh, nickel and dime your, your, your workers for taking bathroom breaks and, and being human beings instead of the automatons that they are on paper. Oh, <sighs> rant over. That's, that's it. I think we should uh, keep on with the, the chapter. We're getting close to nine yeah. o'clock. Machine works without railways, without manure factories, and to adapt this machinery, these railways, these irrigation engines, etc., to local conditions, a certain spirit of invention, a certain amount of technical skill, that lie dormant as long as spades and plowshares are the only implements of cultivation, must be developed. 
If fields are to be properly cultivated and are to yield the abundant harvest man has the right to expect, it is essential that workshops, foundries, and factories develop within the reach of the fields. A variety of occupations, a variety of skill arising therefrom and working together for the common aim. These are the genuine forces of progress. And now let us imagine the inhabitants of a city or territory, whether vast or small, stepping for the first time onto the path of the social revolution. We are sometimes told that nothing will have changed, that the mines, the factories, etc. will be expropriated and proclaimed national or communal property, that every man will go back to his usual work, and that the revolution will then be accomplished. But this is a dream. The social revolution cannot take place so simply. We have already mentioned that should the revolution break out tomorrow in Paris, Lyon, or any other city, should the workers lay hands on factories, houses, and banks, present production would be completely revolutionized by this simple fact. Okay, so that answers the, the question that you had before of how this revolution would be taking place. Basically, you have to have enough people on your side in, in a given place that, that all agree that this is what we're going to do. This, we're, we're revolting so that we can seize for ourselves and collectively own the means of production. And then you just do it, you know. With, mm -hmm. with, with enough people, you have a tipping point. You go and you take over the factories, and you say, now nah, the workers, you own the factory. It's, it's basically just transferring ownership from private hands, and in this case, private means the owner, into um, more collectivized hands. I, I guess it's not exactly public hands because it's not the government, but it's the workers themselves. Um, so you're doing away with, with private ownership. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, does that, does that make sense at all? Yeah. Okay, cool. It's, it's becoming clear. Yeah. I, I will say um, so far, the literature is a little confusing, but you're you're clearing it up oh, for well, me. I mean, the, I, I mean, again, I, I have to apologize again because this is just a particularly dense chapter. It's it's just there's been many other chapters where things were you know moving along at a good clip, and he wasn't enumerating all the the silk and, and cotton trading of various places and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so this is his conception. People just seize the means of production. And then they own it from that point on. And his idea is that because so many people are on board with the system, and if you do it right, so many people are benefiting from this system, that that kind of is your safeguard against, you know, Scrooge McDuck coming back into the picture and trying to take everything back over, right? Oh, yeah. So um, the, the threats to revolution are, are from within, from people trying to seize power for themselves, you know, especially the people that have been dispossessed of their vast wealth, you know, raising some group of their people that they make promises to, say, oh, you know, I'll make you foreman of my factory if you help me take it back over. Um, and then also from without, from, from other countries invading, saying, you know, this is obviously a weak point, we can take over this country and do it our way again. The best safeguard, in his opinion, is is the people themselves. So, if you have people that are, are well fed, um, that have all the the needs of of, of basic subsistence, um, as well as ownership in their place of work, and and feel like they really have agency in their life and ability to to control their destiny, that's your best safeguard against all these threats, both in the country and, and from with outside the country of, of taking it back and, and reverting thing back, everything back to the way it was, right? So the owner tries to come in and all the workers get together and like, no, we we're, we're, have a good thing going here. And they, they put down his rebellion, you know, an invading army comes in and they find it impossible to, I mean, for one thing, there's no one leader they can just topple and, and seize control from ownership is, is spread out. So, you, so you'd have to take over everybody. And together, everyone's like, no, we have a good thing going here. We're going to resist. We have good reason. We have, um, you know, real, true, material progress in our lives. We like how things are going. We're going to resist rule. 
from any one person who's going to seize control again. And that's, that's his idea. I think it's not a bad idea if you can at least get to that point where people do have a better life. Agency. It's just hard to envision in Absolutely. current times. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the author, Ursula K. Le Guin, has a quote. I, I like to say it a lot on the stream, too. And it's, it's, it's easier to imagine Armageddon or the end of the world than it is to imagine um, the end of capitalism. It seems inevitable. It seems... Like, its power is absolute. But the same was true of kings. You know, the divine rule of kings, the divine right of kings. And yet those were toppled as well. So, just because it seems undoable and, like, an overwhelming force is arrayed against you, not necessarily true. History keeps moving. There's, there's no end of history where, like, that's it. This is just going to be the system forever. So gives me hope anyway and and you know i try to do this stream with the uh, the mind of just pulling in a few more people you know mm -hmm. getting a few more people on on our side and then them maybe pulling in a few more people to the point where we have enough people that we can actually do something about it not necessarily a, you know any sort of violent revolution i believe just more in a, in a transition to first in a new economy and then you know, a transfer to uh, a different political framework that's more democratic itself, you know, mm -hmm. more directly de democratic, not all this, this top-down stuff where, you know, federal can overrule, the state can overrule the local, but invest the power within local communities, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to, to bring up or, or add or? This time. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry. No, I'm enjoying myself. I'm. I've learned a lot. It's it's gonna feel weird to go back to like listen to this episode and be like. That's what sex. That makes sense. <laughs> Sorry. Why aren't we learning this? In anywhere. Ah. So my theory on that is that especially as you're going through elementary and, and high school education. Teachers and, and people that set, well, I guess not so much teachers, but people that set curriculum, and then also the teachers when they're teaching that curriculum, they try to remain neutral, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to try and bias you versus one system or another. And perhaps they think if they, if they talk about these sorts of things as possible, that they're going to be biasing you towards socialism, communism, anarchy, any of these sorts of alternative systems. So they just don't even really bring it up. Or they might look at it very, at a very surface level, like, like how can we analyze this in, academically? But the, it's never entertained as a, as a real possibility. Mm -hmm. However, Taking that stance is itself a political position. You cannot literally be neutral. It's just an impossibility. Because if you're trying to be neutral, you end up reinforcing the status quo, whatever that may be. And in this case, it's capitalism. Mm -hmm. So if you never even get to the point where you can question capitalism at all, that's all that in and of itself is promoting capitalism. So that's, that, I think that's a big reason why it doesn't really come up in the educational system. Um, you may read something like Animal Farm. Like, I remember I read Animal Farm in high school. Uh, have you read that book yourself? I was supposed to. Okay. It's, it's, it's you know, you could miss it. You wouldn't really be missing anything. Stalinism, right? Yeah, it was basically anti-Stalinism. But, you know... Like, it was heavily implied, although it was never necessarily said when I, when I was reading it, that it was anti-communism. It's like, this is what communism leads to, so it's just the same as, as capitalism, but worse. You know? okay. So, that was at least the, the impression that I got going through, you know, a fairly liberal, fairly diverse uh, elementary school and, and, and high school. 
and even through college, like there was there was one philosophy class that I dropped. I had to drop the the first week to take something else, but we were gonna go over Marxism as just like one thing. But that that was it. That was like my only exposure to any sort of communism thought or theory or anything like that throughout my entire academic career. Would you say that was a similar experience to you, or did you? It was something that we definitely glossed over. It was just like, Marxism, not for us. Let's yeah. go on to the next thing. Right. It was like a short paragraph in a textbook filled with a whole bunch of other ideologies. Yeah. It was just like, the, you know, the theory of the week. That, you know, mm-hmm. the, you know it, it's just like when, when people study religion in schools. You can't advocate for any particular religion that's against the law in the public school system. But you can look at it very, kind of, again, a very surface level. These are what uh, these particular Christians believe. Here's their tenets. Here's their holidays. Stuff like that. It's very, very fact-based, but never... And you might want to consider doing it. You, you, that would be crossing the line. Um, so, you know, you end up not advocating for any particular religion. Um, it just it just looked at as a very academic thing, and the same is, is true of, of different competing political philosophies. Um, so that I guess that was my again very long answer of why we don't see this one in school. Why why do you think we don't see why we don't really even entertain these ideas? I think education has become a very capitalist business model. Absolutely true. Like kids aren't really going to school to learn anymore. It's to take standardized testing to get more funding. Why is it the kids' job to get funding? That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Like, like how is, is now... Yeah, yeah. How is that... How, and how is that a good thing? Like, oh, your kids aren't learning? Well, we're going to give you less money so that they can learn better? You how don't is, need the resources. Yeah, really, how does that work? Kids. Like... You know, oh, oh, you're not doing well with those those textbooks from 1965 that that uh, still or 1945 that, that that still talk about integration as as trouble to come or something like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're not doing well with those textbooks. Well, we're going to give you less money now because they couldn't learn from those bad textbooks that you had. And, and Can I jump in on this? Yeah, absolutely. So building up. Project too because I don't know how well it's it's picking I'm loud. up. <laughs> Building out from Bree's point too, with standardized testing, it's bullshit because not all kids process information the same way, but all kids are administered the same test, and kids that have like IEPs or in special ed do not receive the same accommodations they do in the regular classroom setting that they do to take the standardized test. But because of the funding, they're still encouraged to take the test, even though that test usually goes very poorly for them, despite if they were in their regular setting, they would have done much better because they were getting the supports that they need. Right. Sure. And these tests don't measure, like, if you really were concerned about kids or the future, you shouldn't measure them on that kind of a test. You should look at progress. Right. Mm-hmm. How, like, Absolutely. how did the child do compared to the previous test or previous, you know, assignments? It's about knowledge acquisition, not do, can I check all the boxes on this geriatric man with lots of money and powers idea of what I need to know? Can Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think those are some... some very Im- important points um, and it shouldn't just be about yeah box ticking did they did they meet this this certain threshold that now we can quantify just how much learning is taking place so that we can give you money accordingly it should it, sh- it should be you're right it should be about progress and it should be oriented more towards the love of learning like and school's a drag an investment in the, the way future. that it's done an investment in the future. It should be... That's what kids are. That's and we're for sure not taking into account that we know that there are 
different types of intelligences. Absolutely. And standardized testing doesn't really, there's no like hands on things. Like your visuals are very limited. Emotional intelligence, which is so important. I mean, at least for me, that's where I feel like I thrive. Mm -hmm. That's not being taken into account. No, because it's, it's not as much able to be transferred into a marketable skill that you right. can then use to be a good employee. And that's another component of education. A lot of it is about learning to be obedient, shutting up, listening to the person who is in, in the uh, uh, authority figure space mm -hmm. and following directions, uh, which prepares you for office work, factory work, getting a job basically. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily make you a better person or a more thoughtful or caring person. Um, it certainly doesn't make you want to learn more if your entire personality has to be contained within these predetermined parameters of, of behavior. Um, so yeah, yeah, you're right. It, 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 you know, coming back to your central point, it, it, it is very much education has become very much oriented around producing good little workers mm -hmm. more than good people even to sustain the capitalism right to sustain capitalism for sure i went to school for so long to be a teacher and mm -hmm. then one day we were just talking and it clicked it was just like how much am i gonna teach these kids like i think when i was in high school i had a lot of leniency with my teachers so i could do things in a more creative way like I didn't really write essays until college I always made short films oh that's cool but could I do that as we're going further into like I feel like kids have to do standard assessing more so and I oh it's just so crazy I did, there's and so I many of them now yeah nine years ago I can't imagine what it's like now absolutely the testing or the yeah. testing the it just feels so you can't really breathe right. like these kids are going through so much every day to prepare for getting money so they can keep learning and it keep keep living really yeah right we gotta change it i don't know how i mean mm -hmm. reforming some things and defunding get rid of get rid of standardized testing period yeah. I mean, I watched a group take the last round of MCAs. Mm -hmm. I was like a proctor for it, and it's really scary. They get 40 minutes. After that, the computer just turns black, and then the question, if they're doing well, the questions get progressively harder until they tank, and then it like drops down to something that a kindergartner can answer. And it does it all over again. It's wow. really weird. I don't quite understand how that's helpful to them. I remember when I took the MCAs. They were just like, you have to, you have to do well to graduate. I yep. don't know if that is that true though. Do you have to do well to on the MCAs to graduate? I don't, I don't think yeah. I did great. I, I mean, they make barely graduate. They make them keep taking them until they pass, which is gross. I don't think I that took that's it the helpful. math one five times, and then I didn't yeah. know until I got to college that I had a learning disability and I couldn't like numbers. Oh, I can't I, really I, process. I, I hate they numbers too. All the time, they get so focused on boys because the behaviors are so much more obvious. Because men have a very set like these are the emotions you have and you have anything beyond that realm of five feelings is abnormal and then you know people pick it up faster yeah it's really sad sorry it's sad and 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 limiting the the range of emotions that boys can have is, is damaging to them as well mm -hmm. like you look at the, the way that that boys naturally develop uh, before they they've had ground into their head that they can't cry about this and they can't cry about that. They have basically the same range of emotions as, as little girls have. Um, they're just as kind, they're just as caring, 
They, they cry when they get hurt or they're scared. Um, it's normal, but then that's, that's socialized out of, out of boys' heads. Don't uh, be weak. Don't right. Be a- yeah. Uh, but it's, it's not the, the natural progression. Uh, it would not be how boys would behave if they were allowed to just be who they are. Um, so, yeah. I don't, know. don't know how we got on that part, but that's okay. I love these tangents. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, is, there, is there anything else that's coming up for you? Like, any of the things we've been talking about? I will say I've had a lot of information come in, so yeah. I have. Sorry. I have a lot of different things going through my head, but not a lot of questions right now. Um, it doesn't have to be questions. Like, like, what? Do you, what do you think about any of this? Maybe, maybe I'm asking too broad of questions. Um, do, um, sorry. Do any of the points? Maybe we can start there. Do any of the points that Kropotkin is talking about? Does it make sense how it, it, it might take place, at least in his time, or...? Yeah, it, it seems like it would be a more reasonable thing to accomplish than, I think, right. now, even though we're trying to get rid of this capitalist mindset. It's just so engraved into Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Um, and it's gross. I, it I'd is like gross. To, I'm part of the problem, I'm sure. I'd like to not be. Oh, you know, you, you can't blame yourself for any of this sort of thing. It, it, it's a systemic problem. So it's the, it's the system just kind of bleeds into your mindset, no matter how much you might even want to resist it. Like, you know. Um, so here's, here's an example. Just at, at my job, I am basically a manager. I, I'm, I'm the lead gardener. Um, and I have an employee that, that works underneath me. And sometimes I will, I will catch her on her phone or perhaps I know she's not working all that hard because it's hot out. And, you know, we've been doing the same weeding job for, for hours. Um, and I catch that little voice in the back of my head being like, you should go over and tell her she needs to get back to work because she's costing the company money and like this is not professional and blah 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 and then I'm like wait a minute I'm not the owner of this company what do I care if if she pulls you know 100 weeds per hour versus 200 weeds per hour overall we're getting our work done uh, if she needs to take more time to, to complete her work because it's hot out who am I to say that, that, that she shouldn't do that and that she can't meet the needs of her body at that particular time. And why would I, why would I assume that she's purposely not working hard? Like these are all just, I believe, capitalist sort of mindset just kind of creeping into my head that, you know, you know it's, 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 it's cliches like, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. And, you know, you, your time is not your own while we, you're at work. You, your time belongs to somebody else as though you're literally selling your body and, and everything that goes with it to your employer for all of that time, which would have been a ridiculous concept to people in past ages. Um, again, getting back to the book Bullshit Jobs, he talks about how before there were time pieces, time was a much more fluid concept. There were, there were certainly absolutes like noon dawn, dusk, these were times that, that you could measure, but they would also fluctuate, you know, at least the dawn and dusk would fluctuate um, from, from season to season. So it was not as set of a concept. So the idea that you would sell yourself to your lord for eight hours a day and your every move was controlled by them would be ludicrous. Instead, work just tended to happen in, in kind of spurts, basically. So you would you know, do a whole bunch of blacksmithing if that was your profession um, whenever the iron came in to do it. And then there would be a lot of downtime where you would do other things. You might visit family. You might uh, grow food for yourself. It was, it was not just this rigid regimentation, 40-hour work week that it is today. And, that, and all that changed with the Industrial Revolution and the advent of measured time. 
Um, so to them, it would just seem really bizarre. To what do you mean you work nine to five? What even? What is nine to five? Like, you know, it was a, it was a completely foreign concept. Um, so that's interesting. Just how much that mindset too has crept into everyone's head to the point where we're like, oh shoot, I'm, you know, twenty minutes late for work. Well, so. Are you, are you not going to get your work done? Oh, no, no, I'll still get my work done, but it's, it's unprofessional. They're like, no. It's not that it's unprofessional. It's that your boss thinks they own your time from this time to that time and that you have to be having a steady output of work that entire time when virtually no jobs actually work out that way. Even in landscaping, there's times where we're transitioning from one job to another. That's, that's essentially a, a kind of a downtime, but... The idea that we're being steadily productive from the time we clock in to the time we clock out doesn't really work out. And, th- and there'll be times with, with landscaping too where it's down to only one person has anything to do. Like we have to, to use the leaf blower to blow off the pathways and, and that's the only job left to do. Well, what are, what are we supposed to do? Like sharpen tools furiously as, as, as one person is working? No. You, you stand around, you, you chat, you make the job a little bit more bearable. And there's, and there's really nothing inherently wrong with that. I don't think. What, 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 what ideas are coming up for you? I mean, personally, getting a little uh, closer home. I did lose my job um, last week. Yeah. A little difficult. Um, it was, I mean, it was difficult for us as well, obviously not yeah. nearly as much as for you. But... but that just reminds me of like our bathroom breaks were essentially um, monitored. Yeah. In a way. The trackers in the in the trucks that would. Yeah. Tattle on us essentially. And you. With the fluctuating weather, that's gonna have an impact on your body. It's gonna have an impact on everything that's going on, especially like when you're trying to stay hydrated. Absolutely. And they're just like, oh we need you to stay hydrated because we're not going to pay your hospital bills if you like need to be go in to get you know yes. an IV right. which reducedly priced um, and then you know some jobs you don't get those benefits like like at insurance all. well yeah I, I currently don't have insurance so yeah that's, that's yeah. very true and then well we don't want to pay for this but like right. it's just that the hyper focused on as though you're somehow stealing from them if you take... The job's getting done. An, yeah, that's it. And, that's, and that really should be the way things go. Is the job getting done? Is it not getting done? Not, well, our computer says you're, you're going to this, that, and the other gas station, and, you know, th- that's time you could be doing other things. And, like, we, you know, we, oh, God. I'm sure you were there for the meeting as well uh, a couple of years ago when... when they, they put together a fucking PowerPoint presentation about all the ways that we should be feeling really guilty about how we were spending our time on the job. And they had it broken down to like, you know, we, we logged uh, 20,000 trips to this particular uh, gas station in the last year. And it cost an average of, and you spent an average of 15 minutes of your time there. Uh, and translate it into money. This is the money that the company, which is, it's how BS. How is that my problem? It's, well, how is it my problem? But also that's BS. It's not as though we would have, you know, talking about the Mo Crews, because they were really getting down on the Mo Crews. Are the Mo Crews going to find 15 more minutes of grass to cut in that time? Are they just going to go freelance some, some, some lawn services to someone else in that 15 minutes? It's absolute BS. It, 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 it doesn't actually affect them. They just wanted to... They, essentially, what they wanted to do is say, we control your time from the time you clock in until the time you clock out. So you better well do the, the, only the things we say and not deviate from that course at all. They didn't like the fact that we, I guess, powered our own vehicles. I'm sure if they had it their way, that we would be in automatic cars with, with preset destinations that we'd all just pile into arrive at a job scene and it would start a big clock and then it would count down until zero and we better be in that truck to the next job site or else we're getting left behind. 
I'm sure that would be their ideal uh, world. um, Sorry. It felt like a hierarchy because they were complaining about these people that have very physical jobs stopping at gas stations to get coffee. But at the same time, within the office, you know, they can go to the Another Keurig. good point. So many times a day, they can go to the bathroom whenever they want, and it's not an issue. Yeah. As, as, as though office work doesn't also have its ebbs and flows. I mean, it's time where, where things are really crunch time, where you have a million clients to satisfy all at once, and then other times where, like, you know, you can update your Facebook every few minutes, and no one cares because there's nothing to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I had one comment coming in from uh, Magnu, Magnus Xavier. I believe that that's, that's how that one's pronounced. Uh, and they would like to know if we could recommend a previous audiobook that we have enjoyed. Oh. Uh, well, the one that I've been talking about recently is, is called Bullshit Jobs, and it's by David Graeber. Um, it's available on Amazon, which it's... it's it's how I listen to it. I, you know, it, Audible comes with a, your Amazon account, and it's it's really easy to do, uh, just to add that on. So that's that's how I get a lot of my audiobooks. Um, it may be available in audiobook form other places. I don't know, but bullshit jobs. David Graeber, an excellent breakdown on how basically about forty-five to fifty-five percent of all jobs in America are bullshit in one form or another. And that's not just like, a, a, he distinguishes it from a shit job, which is just a job you don't like that, that, that treats you poorly. It's, it's jobs that the workers themselves report as having no use. Um, it's it's, it's uh, things like someone who is at his university, whose entire job was to go around and apologize for why the maintenance people hadn't been by. That was their entire job. Um, it's people that hire underlings to show how big and important they are, but their underlings don't actually have anything to do that, that's meaningful or productive. That it, it's, it's jobs that you could eliminate entirely and it would not affect the economy one bit. 45 to 55% in, in both the US and I believe the UK, he studied a lot as well. That was his estimate. Uh, that was his estimation. It was an incredibly eye-opening book, so I highly recommend Bullshit Jobs, David Graeber. Any, any books? Can you spell Graeber? Uh, G- oh, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, G-R-A-E-B-E-R. Okay. Are there any books? And it doesn't have to be theory books. Any, any books at all? Audio books that, that, that you may have listened to recently? I or- mean, I, I mostly listen to fiction. Um, that's fine. But I'm a big, um, you know, I like my thrillers. I like my serial killers, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, I think my most recent one I've listened to about five times. It's um, Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. Cannot recommend that enough. Um, it's got mommy issues. It's got alcoholism. It discusses rape culture within small communities oh, and how wow. it's kind of just... Um, you know, hidden under the rug. Absolutely. And I am from a small town, so it's just like, this kind of feels like home. Did it really? Like, but you, it you felt just... so gross. I was just like, oh no. And then. Did you see your small town differently after reading that? I haven't been back since. Oh, okay. Well, at least just thinking um, back on it. Do you think back on it differently now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, small towns have this like weird. Allure of being charming. Yeah. Depends like, on where like, they are. It's like are. Mayberry from uh, uh, what do you what do you call it? Uh, the Andy what? Griffin Show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And just you know, oh, how did they? You know. And it was just like, oh, everything from like my teenage years was very problematic. Where was an adult? Oh, they they knew. They just didn't say anything. Oof. That sort of thing. So, yeah, sharp objects. Um, it's an HBO miniseries starring Amy Adams. Oh, that's cool. Give it a watch, give it a listen, read the book. I did all three at the same time. Wow. I was very into it. Still am. That's cool. great ending. Nice. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely have to check that one out. Sharp objects. I'll, I'll try to remember to put that up in the, the show notes as well. In fact, I will open a tab right now 
just so that I don't forget when I, because otherwise I'm going to forget. Cause sure. <laughs> so it's called Sharp Objects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Gilly and Flynn, you know, we all know the premise of Gone Girl now, an inspirational tale. Oh, Gone tale. Girl, that was, that was her thing, huh? Yes. Okay. The sharp objects was hers. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see if we can find any independent booksellers. Not on the first page of results, because it's on Google. And they're going to stifle competition by putting their own results out first. Don't be evil. That was their motto at one time. <laughs> it's just coming out with books from Google.com. Well, I'll just use this as a placeholder. I'm gonna, I'll try and find an independent bookseller that, that carries this book. But for now, just leave that open as a tab so that I can remember later. Barnes & Noble is a British company now. Okay. Yeah. Well, that would still be better than Google for sure. So... We'll leave that over there. And from uh, a writing perspective, I will say that Gillian Flynn does a great job um, with her female protagonist. Oh, yeah? Um, she kind of puts them in a way that you don't see white women in. Hmm. It's kind of very, like, Southern Gothic-y. And you can see that Southern she's um, taken um, inspiration from B.C. Andrews. I don't. I don't know. Oh, Andrews. flowers in the attic. Okay, nice I've heard. Flowers. I've heard the the title. I've not read that one. <laughs> don't. I. It's. I've heard it's intense. Schedule a therapy session. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's really intense. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your recommendation there. Thank you. I think we gotta try and just knock out the last bit of this chapter. We only have. Probably about uh, five minutes left. A little okay. over five minutes. So. Are you ready? Let's I, do it. I think we've definitely made a good effort of, of building an entire uh, episode out of not a lot of material. So I, I really appreciate you for that. I feel like I've been talking way too much, though. But there's a lot of, a lot of difficult concepts. You have concepts. great points. I can go on on tangent about anything and relate it to a movie. That's cool. I always love tangents. Even if it's just about a movie, that's cool, too. So... Don't be shy about it. <laughs> International commerce will come to a standstill. So also will the importation of foreign breadstuffs, the circulation of commodities, and of provisions will be paralyzed. And then, the city or territory in revolt will be compelled to provide for itself and to reorganize production. If it fails to do so, it is death. If it succeeds, it will revolutionize the economic life of the country. Just, just a small point about this. In the case of Cuba, he was absolutely right. They had a revolution. I don't know how long it was, but probably pretty immediately, the U.S. started embargoing them to the point where, you know, un until the Soviet Union got involved, they had, like, zero trading partners. They had to completely revolutionize their production for everything um, and, and revolutionize the idea of needing to keep on producing things. So there, there, there are cars that have been in operation since... I guess the 70s, um, that are, are perfectly tuned up, you know, uh, in, in good working order, out of necessity because they've been so isolated by uh, non-revolutionary countries such as the U.S. primarily. Um, and through that necessity, they've also developed a, a really robust, you might even say permaculture scale of agriculture where there, there's tons and tons of local food production um, to the point where they, they, they serve, I think, all of their, food, their, their caloric needs themselves. They, they may at this point import some foods. I'm not entirely sure about that, but... I don't know what that was, but that was a loud thumb. My neighbors are bad. Oh, okay. Wow, that threw me off a little bit. Joe is a living in an apartment. Um, but they're very self, uh, self-reliant. Um, they, they, they produce, and, and at the same time, they have one of the best healthcare systems in the world. Uh, they may not have the same uh, freedom and access to information that, that, that 
we enjoy in, in more, I guess, Western countries. It's kind of a not a, a, a great way of, of describing us, but uh, they may not have the same access to information. They, they, you know, perhaps part of parts of their lives have been more controlled than they would be in in a again first world. Not a great term, but in, in nations that are, are are more part of the global economic system. Let's put it that way. But they provide all their people with with basic stuff. You know, they have they have reached a level where basically all the necessities of life are provided on on a relatively small island. Um, it's it's incredible what they've achieved. So he, you know, this may seem a bit far fetched talking about being completely isolated, but it, it actually has happened uh, in the case of, of Cuba. So yeah, yeah, I definitely recommend looking into more of the history of, of Cuba and we don't talk about the positive things like right Cuba. right well that's the case with with any of these these countries you know uh, well, you, have the, you have the good and the bad absolutely there's going to be good and bad in in any sort of governmental form right um, I mean you could say the same thing about about China uh, and, and how they treat their their um, Uyghur their Muslim population at the same time, U.S., we treat our, our undocumented immigrant population as well as our, our foreign combatant population extremely poorly. Uh, we, we are on the same level as, as anything that China is doing when it comes to human rights abuses. So, yeah, these are bad in both places. But it's not just one side. It's, it's certainly not just one side. It's not... China bad, U.S. good, Cuba bad, U.S. good. These are very simplistic ways of, of looking at the world that, that don't quite capture the entire picture. There's going to be more freedoms and less freedoms in, in different parts of life. Um, and, and more provisions for, for its citizenry and less in different parts of lives, of, of their lives. So, yeah. Not a completely black and white picture, any place they look at. A lot of gray. A lot of great. Um, yeah, so Cuba, interesting case study. Uh, I think it's was it blowback? I think blowback. The the podcast blowback. Now I'm gonna have another thing. I'm gonna have to look up. God damn it! I was hoping to be done by nine. I apologize for keeping you up late. Actual website. Blowback show. Here we go. Who hosts Blowback? What's that? Who, who hosts the show? Uh, I don't actually know. Okay. I haven't, Sorry. I've only heard about it. I haven't... There's so many podcasts. I have a, a, a database that I, that I helped um, collect together with, with other uh, leftist pod... Just, just talking about leftist podcasts, this being mm-hmm. one of them. I think we're up to... 200 entries of active leftist podcasts there's just there's way more than could ever be consumed by any given person which is great it's great that there's that much to say and that many voices out there and we could definitely use more Mm -hmm. um but yeah blowback podcast is talking about the history of cuba right now and and if there's any podcast that i would trust to um paint a fair picture about it it's it's one that's at least coming from a, a leftist perspective so check that one out. I'll put that one too in the show notes. We'll put it over in that column there. All right. Sorry about all that. Uh, anything else you wanted to, to bring up before we, we carry on for the last couple minutes? I think I'm ready to keep on keeping on. All right. I'm, I'm sorry to keep you past no, my head initially said. The quantity of imported provisions having decreased, consumption having increased, One million Parisians working for exportation purposes have been thrown out of work. A great number of things imported today from distant or neighboring countries not reaching their destination. 
Fancy trade being temporarily at a standstill. Fancy trade. What will the inhabitants have to eat I don't six know what months that means. after the revolution? It's not basic. <laughs> yeah, we're not talking about basic trade. This is no. fancy trade. We think that when the stores are empty, the masses will seek to obtain their food from the land. They will be compelled to cultivate the soil, to combine agricultural production with industrial production in Paris and its environs. They will have to abandon the merely ornamental trades and consider the most urgent need, bread. Citizens will- Ah, uh, hence the, the, the title of the book, mm-hmm. the title of my, my stream and, and podcast and YouTube channel, Conquest of Bread. <laughs> Stand in for basic staples of, of human sustenance. Will be obliged to become agriculturalists, not in the same manner as peasants who wear themselves out, plowing for a wage that barely provides them with sufficient food for the year, but by following the principles of market gardeners, intensive agriculture, of light on a large scale. And, and, and this itself, what, he, what he's talking about, intensive market gardening agriculture, it, what, what he means is, is without huge implements. It's, yeah, you, you have a, um, just as much as you can maintain with your basic hand tools, um, and then you, you, you sell to a local market. Or, or in this case, you just give to the local populace whatever you don't need for your own consumption. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that ties in pretty well with, with ideas of uh, permaculture, especially practiced in an urban area where there is less space. Um, that's kind of cool to, to hear him at least talk about that. Do you do any gardening on your, on your own? I know you're kind of in between you're moving and doing I mean, stuff, what I can so. fit in my... Um, Windowsill. Yeah, that's yeah. about it. That's cool. Some, I like my mint. Yeah, mint is mint is a great one. And able to you know, snatch for a nice uh, Moscow mule. Oh, that was nice. I'm sure it makes it just that much better mm-hmm. when it's. it's I there's made nothing this. like fresh mint. Yeah, exactly. It, it 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 tastes better just because you've made it yourself. There's there's something about producing something yourself and actually getting to consume it that just makes it taste that much better by means of the best machinery that man has invented or can invent. They will till the land, not, however, like the country beast of burden a Paris jeweler would object to that. They will reorganize cultivation, not in ten years' time, but at once during the revolutionary struggles from fear of being worsted by the enemy. So, idea being that that Things are kind of urgent when, when revolution has happened and you can no longer rely on international trade to, to feed your people. Mm-hmm. It's going to necessitate uh, an agricultural revolution to be oriented more locally so you can produce enough for your people not to starve, basically. I think that's the idea there. Agriculture will have to be carried on by intelligent beings availing themselves of their knowledge, organizing themselves in joyous gangs for pleasant work, like the men who, a hundred years ago, worked in the Champ de Mar for the Feast of the Federation. Oh. All right, I think we might actually have a, a troll in chat now. Were you born with these ideologies? Have you met an ideological baby before? Is they, are they like coming out of the womb with like their, their fist raised or something like that? So many. <laughs> Revolutionary babies. Oh, that would be good. Which, 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 revolutionary babies? Yeah, yes. for sure. Which ideologies were you born with, Bree? Um, having not the powers of speech or comprehension. You know, I pulled influences just from whatever I could see. <laughs> so, like, window, um, perhaps a fuzzy outline. Of some shapes, maybe some, some people. Colors. Yeah, maybe some people, you know. Mm-hmm. You, you picked your revolutionary influences early. Blues you know. Clues. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. My goodness, conservative Twitter is uh, having a having a moment with uh, recent gay pride in Blues Clues. Which is, <gasps> yes. You finally got literal <laughs> gay frogs. I'm, sh- I'm sure that was put in just for Alex Jones' benefit. The gay, gay frogs and the Blues Clues gay pride parade. Which we love to see it. Yeah. Like, it was basically just naming different types of, of families and, and people. Mm-hmm. Just that they exist. Nothing nothing about them. And that was, that was enough to just send them over the edge. So many pearls clutched. I'm, I'm surprised there are any left for the, the markets these oh. days. It's, 
ridiculous. But we can see so many straight couples doing the most, but you know. Oh yeah, yeah. But just um, mentioning the existence of, of other sorts of people, that's just... Well, Children don't need to know that they don't understand that. Sort of, well, okay, for one thing, you talking about things is what helps children understand the world around them. It's, it's the entire point, right? Yeah. I, I saw a Facebook post and it was just like, I don't think children should be exposed to sexuality in general. And, they, and I was just like, do, do you do, think I mean, that kids aren't gay? Well, yeah, I mean, for that, too. But, like, I I mean, assuming that, that she's thinking that, like, a heteronormative family with a, a mother and a father is, is acceptable, how many kids have never seen their car- their parents kiss before? I mean, maybe if their parents are not... I don't want to think of it. Well, well yeah, but, but, like, I'm sure if that sort of thing happened, the same lady would have no problem with that. Yeah. I'm sure she's the same lady who would put like lady killer on a onesie for like a baby or, or like you know well, future okay. Rico Suave or, or you know, know any of these, these phrases uh-huh. and have no problem with that MFM. I'm the daddy in this situation <laughs> yeah uh-huh. <laughs> what the hell so I don't know I don't know where you're going with that uh, anyway so, so froze Greek so froze Greek no one is born with their ideologies. That's that's what that's part of what an ideology is, is, is something that you adopt and learn as, as you grow as a human being. So mm-hmm. I don't know. You're probably already out of the chat because you've you've made your little comment. Yep, it looks like you're gone already. So whatever. That that <laughs> that's the end of that vignette. I'm gonna lose so much sleep trying to figure out where I came up with my ideologies. I know. Just like I was I, I was born. Was your mother like putting Mao up in, in like audiobooks, like up to the her belly? Absolutely. <laughs> Death to all landlords! That was your first words, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh boy. I'm gonna think about that for a long time. Yeah, it's and it's never the same. I I think it's not the same person. Or are they asking? Re- born into it like I was born into it well adopted into a very conservative I mean family. that could be that could be um, and uh, you know I was I was born into a, a, a very kind of mainline liberal household um, I would not consider it leftist in any stretch I, like I said I didn't learn about I didn't read Marx until a couple years ago maybe maybe even the beginning of last year I think that was the first time I actually picked up the Communist Manifesto um, how many lists are you on now? how many lists am I on? yeah list of list of, list of what? what do you mean? of like bros we should keep an eye on what are they doing? oh 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 of, of, of other people's lists mm-hmm. have I appeared on you know I'd like to think it's at least a, a dozen you know I, I'd like to think my influence <laughs> <laughs> At least enough that some people have taken notes, and but um, I don't know. I, I guess I guess that's one of those things you don't get to know until you know, black You're bag right pulled over your head and you, you pulled into it for questioning and that sort of thing. But I don't know. You'll find out. Yeah. You think, At the you, airport. Oh, <laughs> I could be on an. I, I doubt I'm on a no-fly list. Don't know until I try. Don't know till I try. And I haven't flown in a couple years, so this at least he, he he wants things to be equal. Yeah, I know. He, he might might try to unionize the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag steward is <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um Yeah. Yeah, you never know about those things. It's, it's always bizarre the things that conservatives freak out about too. Seems like they all just have to have their pet crusade. Well, yeah, and that was that was definitely me alone. Just Obviously. wasn't enough gay frogs. I was like, hey, let's put the gay frog juice yeah, in there. Yeah, you know. 
That would make the Muppets more interesting. Yeah. Spice up their lives. You know? Try some more. Oh my. Alright, almost done. Delight, almost when done. not carried to excess, when scientifically organized, when man invents and improves his tools and is conscious of being a useful member of the community. Of course, they will not only cultivate, they will also produce those things which they formerly used to order from foreign parts. And let us not forget that for the inhabitants of a revolted territory, foreign parts may include all districts that have not joined in the revolutionary movement. During the revolutions of 1793 and 1871, Paris was made to feel that foreign parts meant even the country district at her very gates. The speculator in grains at Troy starved the sans-culottes of Paris more effectually than the German armies brought on French soil by the Versailles conspirators. The revolted city will be compelled to do without foreigners, and why not? France invented beetroot sugar when sugar cane ran short during the Continental Blockade. Parisians discovered saltpeter in their cellars when they no longer received any from abroad. Uh, that, was, that was supposed to be saltpeter, not faultpeter. Um, for those of you who may not know, saltpeter is a component of gunpowder. It's one of the essential things you need to, to make gunpowder. So, yeah. If you're talking about a self contained army, it might be a good idea to have a saltpeter reserve, I suppose. Shall we be inferior to our grandfathers? Who with difficulty lisped the first words of science? A revolution is more than the destruction of a political system. It implies the awakening of human intelligence, the increasing of the inventive spirit tenfold, a hundredfold. It is the dawn of a new science, the science of men like Laplace, Lamarck, Lavoisier. It is a revolution in the minds of men more than in their institutions. And economists tell us to return to our workshops, as if passing through a revolution, we're going home after a walk in the Epping Forest. To begin with, the sole fact of having laid hands on middle-class property implies the necessity of completely reorganizing the whole economic life in workshops, in dockyards, and in factories. And the revolution will not fail to act in this direction. Should Paris, during the Social Revolution, be cut off from the world for a year or two by the supporters of middle-class rule, its millions of intellects not yet depressed by factory life, that city of little trades which stimulate the spirit of invention, will show the world what man's brain can accomplish without asking any help from without, but the motor force of the sun that gives light, the power of the wind that sweeps away impurities, and the silent life forces at work in the earth we tread on. We shall see then what a variety of trades, mutually cooperating on a spot of the globe and animated by the social revolution, can do to feed, clothe, house, and supply with all manner of luxuries millions of intelligent men. We need write no fiction to prove this. What we are sure of, what has already been experimented upon and recognized as practical, would suffice to carry it into effect if the attempt were fertilized, vivified by the daring inspiration of the revolution and the spontaneous impulse of the masses. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. We made it. Sure did. <laughs> so yeah, as, as he was saying kind of there, summing up that, that chapter, the revolution is not just the overthrowing of people, it is the, the I guess, fulfilling of promise, you know. Empowering of all people, un unleashing the creativity and the potential of everybody by, by putting them all on, on relatively equal footing and giving them the things they need. A platform to stand on in the form of their basic necessities that they can then push off and contribute whatever they feel like contributing to society. Any, any thoughts at the end of the chapter there? Or is, is we wrap it up and still, still digesting but yeah it does the last part um this i have to say this is a really difficult chapter to enter this book on <laughs> to be your first example oh uh, she, she, she was a little dry but that, that's fine she had some there's, there's just the moist bits yeah <laughs> sorry for saying moist you, you, um, you know moist is not one of those band words yet so <laughs> not 
yet. Not Most. yet. <laughs> um, kind of the idea of a revolution. It's not just overthrowing like one person on top. It's overthrowing those societal values and right. replacing it with something that would hopefully benefit the masses. Mm-hmm. It's something to think about. Yeah. That that stood out to me. Um, there was a lot of a lot of facts about uh, silks and. Oh, I'm really glad I, I skipped that part. I think I probably would just, if I had this to redo, I would have uh, skipped probably this chapter, and we would have done. We would have just skipped to the next chapter. <laughs> like. But what are your thoughts about um, kind of keeping things local? I think it has some strengths, for sure, um, in the sorts of things that he talked about, where people would interact with one another on a face-to-face basis, which helps you invest emotionally in the people that, that you are dependent on and who are dependent on you. Um, it helps with the idea of if you're going to be cut off by the rest of the world, if you're having this revolution on your own, uh, you're going to have to face shortages of supply line just out of necessity because that's what war does. It, it disrupts supply lines a lot and, and business as usual. Um, and I think it can help people become more resilient, uh, especially if we're doing it in a, in a way where we're trying to you know, intentionally build that resilience into um, future production especially. So we're doing those small and slow solutions of permaculture where, you know, you say you plant a fruit tree this year, you may not get fruit until, you know, the 10th year. Mm -hmm. Um, It's an investment in the future, but once that investment produces dividends, you're going to be in a much more secure place and you're going to be glad that 10 years ago you planted that tree. Um, And especially with all the, the unknowns coming from weather pattern changes from, from climate change. Um, it, I mean, it just seems like in the past few years, even the summers have become a lot more unpredictable to the point where it doesn't feel like they can even predict what the weather's going to be day to day very well. Like they'll say it's going to rain, but then it'll rain in a very concentrated spot and maybe not the spot that you're at. And you don't really get the rains, those like long sustaining rains that we used to get. Um, And it's been very dry just across the entire northern hemisphere this year, already into fire season. So all these these forces that are beyond any one of our controls, you know, doesn't matter how many, unfortunately it doesn't matter how many bottles we recycle, um, doesn't matter if we individually go vegan or make other conscious choices, our choice alone is is not going to make that difference. It really comes down to just a handful of of very powerful and wealthy and influential companies that have the greatest amount of impact on climate change. So recognizing that and that we're not just going to topple them in a day, yeah, starting local, building these systems up locally, and starting to rely on one another. I think that's another important thing. It's it's kind of putting these revolutionary ideas into practice more. Like relying on one another opposed to just like a figurehead or a charity or or yeah any centralized power but just practicing mutual aid um i had a a really short episode a while ago and i called it stone soup socialism the idea being that like here's something we can all do um as long as we have a little bit extra money to to buy a bunch of soup um or, or a little bit more and, and make soup ourselves. We can just take a stock pot, go to a local park, assuming you're in a, a populated area um, that enough people would happen by, and just start cooking it. And just you don't necessarily even have to have a sign, but you could just say, hey, free soup. You start handing it out. And then just start making a habit of that. And then eventually the idea being that people will, will come to, uh, you know, know that this is going to be an event 
and through their own volition are going to be like, hey, you know, you want some of my fresh basil that I just picked? Let's, let's throw that in the stew. Yeah. You know, people start adding to it. Maybe someday some, you know, people start performing music for the event. It'll, it'll become a community event. And just using that as a very basic way to just start forming those bonds of community again that have kind of been lost in these really atomized, you know, very compartmentalized uh, civilizational structures that we have you know I mean for a small example I, I know the people across the hall by name I know the lady next door by name I don't know the guy across the hall he's very quiet he keeps to himself and then I don't know anyone else in this entire like 60 unit complex I don't know anyone else by name and we all live together we, we, I mean we see each other every day we, I might even say hi to, to certain people but I don't really know them I don't it's a strange thing about being in really dense societies or, or communities that there is a level of alienation where you're surrounded by people that you don't know and whose lives only intersect with yours on a very surface level. So the idea is just start to break that down. Start to actually get to, to know your neighbors even by name. You know, Hopefully some of your neighbors will start coming to it. They'll start to get to know the people and then just through the natural exchange of information and ideas, you'll get to know, oh, so-and-so is, is really good at fixing cars. I should bring my car to them, you know? And I can trade my, my car repairs. He'll give me that, and then and I'll give him, I don't know, I have a, a garden. I'll give him a bunch of fresh tomatoes out of my garden whenever he comes by. Or I brew my own beer. I'll give him some beer, you know? The idea of just starting to build up that, that community network at the, at the very local level. I think that is important. Um, especially if, if anarchy really appeals to you. I think anarchy has to kind of, by necessity, be, be a local thing. Um, and then you can start introducing things like, maybe if you get to the point where it's a huge event, you could, you could move from there to like organizing rent strikes until your, your complex gets fixed. Because Basically, wherever you go, unless you're in a really luxurious place, you're going to have landlords that, that don't maintain it to one degree or another. Like, there's a, you've probably hit it. There's a giant pothole in our parking lot. It's like six inches deep. It's been there for over a year now. They've done nothing with it. They, they take our money every month, but they don't really do anything with it. So just getting together and saying, hey, what can we do as a community now? Now, now you're starting to build real power. And perhaps from that point you can branch out and say, hey, there's a bunch of us that are interested in, you know, uh, retail food service. Why don't we open a cafe together or something like that? No one person of us could do it on our own, but maybe if we get enough people together to pool our money, maybe if we organize a fundraiser during one of these, these stone soup events, we could really do something, mm -hmm. you know? I think it just really stay. it takes something some act to 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 break through the the compartmentalization that 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 tends to invade our lives start moving towards a real community and a real reliance on each other i like that yeah i like that too it's been hard for me to to put into action myself but that's just part of the you know what this capitalist system kind of takes from you. It's just, I, just, I just don't have the, the time and the energy really to, to organize anything like that yet. But yet. I'll say yet. I would really like to, to get to the point where I can start doing that. But I just haven't. Yet. We'll get there. How, how do you feel about localization and, and relying on, on local stuff? Does it, are you like, just what's the point? Like, we live in a global society? Like, like how are you coming at it? I guess I I have an example maybe sure um, like when donating clothes you could donate to Goodwill mm -hmm. or you could donate to something locally and it's going to benefit someone in your community you know and not be shipped off here there and everywhere I, I didn't know that that was a thing until someone told me and, yeah I'd rather see someone in my community I mean, I don't know if that's not a great example, but... 
Oh, I think that's a fine example. Yeah, I, I like Something the, more tangible, you know? You can, I like the idea of helping your neighbors. Right. And, and if you need help, your neighbors can help you. Right. I, I, think, I think just kind of in general that that's how humans tend to orient themselves, you know? They tend to think most and, and have the most empathy for people that they, they interact with on a daily basis. It's just, yeah. it's just a natural course of, of the way things go. Like, like we want to help people all across the world, but sometimes it just feels like we need to help, yeah, help locally and then... Radiate out yeah. from there? Yeah, little by little. I think that's... It seems more reasonable. Sure, for sure. And more obtainable. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, again, that, that fits in really well with, with a permaculture mindset of, of, of small and slow solutions. And also, uh, there's another principle that, that goes design from the patterns to the details. So, that, so when we're talking about building community, we look at the patterns. And the, the patterns could be something as simple as, as where do people congregate naturally? Maybe that's where we should start trying to do this, this stone soup thing, or see if that's the, something that appeals to you. Maybe that's where we could organize a, a, a uh, just a, a, a plant swap or a seed swap or something like that, or, or uh, a repair event where people that know how to repair small appliances could set up shop and help people learn how to repair their toaster or their TV or something like that, you know. So just observing those patterns and then building it down to the details of, okay, what is our specific event going to be? And, you know, how are we specifically going to connect with community members? But, but just starting with those patterns. Of like, here's a bad pattern. Here's maybe a, a different pattern we can introduce to, to kind of break that cycle. That's what I think. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's part of why I do this, too, again, is to just start to get people to think in this idea. Spread these ideas out slowly. Very slowly. Like, I mean, tonight, not all that many viewers tonight, but that's, that's, that's quite all right. Um, happy to still keep trying at it. You know, keep at it. <laughs> ah, so, what is the next chapter even going to be on? I think it's just going to be, oh, it's on agriculture. So the final chapter, which, which I'm assuming is going to be next week, uh, although I may end up having to work Friday, so it may be an unusual schedule next week. But we'll, we'll see. But the next one's going to be about agriculture. It's going to wrap up the entire book. Um, and then we get to move on to another book. And our next book is going to be uh, Principles of Communism by, by Friedrich Engels. And the basic idea is that what that book is, is what most people assume the Communist Manifesto is, where he just goes point by point and kind of lays out, this is how we do organize society. And this Engels with an I or an E. Engels. So Engels? it's E-N-G-E-L-S, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so we'll do that, and then we'll do, because that's a pretty short one, so we'll do uh, maybe some short anarchist ones. I, I try to like to alternate back and forth between anarchist and, and communist and, and you know, potentially socialist, and, and eventually I'll start integrating in more permaculture materials. Uh, we're going to go through um, permaculture designer's manual, which is the most important text that's been written in permaculture. It's what they teach permaculture design uh, certificate courses on. Um, yeah, that's my certificate right there. Um, so we'll go through that book, and then we'll start integrating stuff from new urbanism in, which is going to be probably the hardest one. It's kind of the most niche of, of all of them. But I think it, it applies to all this stuff. It's New urbanism deals with building community and organizing society in ways that facilitate interaction and satisfaction with, with the place that you live. Making it more of a, a place itself, not just, you know, a placeholder for where you happen to live now and where you work now. It's a lot to, to try and, and, and push together, but I think little by little, we're You're doing it. Start, starting to get there. I've been, I've been managing to keep up with this uh, 
fairly well, I would say. So, all right. I think that this is a good time to, to kind of wrap things up. So if sure. you have any more thoughts you'd like to get out before we kind of wrap things up or questions, I know I really hit you with a lot of information. I'd just like to say thank you for having me on. Oh, you're quite I, welcome. This has, been a, this has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. Um, still processing a lot, but... Yeah. It's a lot of ideas that made sense, but... How you integrate them into modern life, how yeah, you actually do them. I'm sure there's a lot of questions still. You know, if we were taught these ideologies a little more thoroughly, I think... So I didn't come into this kind of, you know. Yeah. I don't want to. Well, you should have been following my my show for all this time. <laughs> Just kidding. I I enjoy a lengthy backlog. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's there's definitely now uh, quite the archive over at the YouTube.com. You can check out Bread to Theory. I don't think I I haven't switched it over yet. Uh, I it, I should switch it to Bread underscore Theory, but right now I don't know if that's even showing up on the thing. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, look at my channel real quick. So, we have a bunch of videos on all the different chapters that we've covered before, as well as uh, Sunday, I kind of just do a more freeform thing where I pick videos, just random YouTuber videos of, of leftists and I, or of, of people on the right, and then I critique them. Um, and then I just go through and add my own opinion to them. Um, so you can have all the archives. I've organized things into a number of playlists. So you can look at uh, my permaculture playlist, which I did recently. Um, and then there's the, the various books that I've done. Only, only two books so far, but there's the Communist Manifesto, which I may, I may redo at some point because the audio is, is pretty bad. I was just learning things at that point. Um, but they are there for your viewing and, and listening pleasure. Uh, and then, of course, Conquest of Bread. You can see the full playlist. I think I have every single episode up there right now. Um, and then I have a bunch. i am got kind of a backlog of videos i got to process. But, but soon we'll get to uh, the end of this book, and I'll have everything up on YouTube, and we'll be ready to move forward with the next book. Um, and then I have a bunch of my shorter, well, just one of my shorter vignettes and that sort of thing. So you can kind of check things out there. Um, and then, of course, my podcast is the audio version of pretty much all of this stuff. Once in a while, I don't put it up on the, pod, on the podcast because it doesn't really make sense. It's a very visual thing or something like that. But for the most part, it's available. Um, wherever fine podcasts are found. So just go to Bread Theory there. In fact, you can find all of my links on my link tree. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and buy my art, all that different stuff by going to lnktr.ee slash bread underscore theory. Um, so yeah, and, and if you haven't yet, you should uh, like and or you should follow this particular um, Twitch stream. I would really appreciate it that uh, really appreciate that. So then you'll get notified when I go live, and we can chat and interact in the future. And then we're gonna pull up the stuff that Bree is going to be getting into pretty soon. You want to say a little bit more about your particular podcast forthcoming? Yeah, I'm really excited to get the ball running. Um, I'll be hosting with my best friend Cisco Vega on the Smartest Suits. I know. Um, and explore things that um, I think are mainly explored by um, mostly white men and give mm -hmm. it a little more color on the lens. There you go. Yeah, but check us out. Hopefully we'll be up and running. Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, I know you're in the middle of... You, have you, you haven't moved yet, have you? You're no. You're in the process of moving still? End of this month. Um, End of this month, all right. Yeah. Then I can get the ball running. Um, you definitely should. You know, the hardest thing about doing these, these podcasts or the streams or whatever is just committing to doing it and then doing it. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't think you're ready, 
I certainly didn't think I was ready the first time I, I went live with my stream. Um, and yeah, you can, you can see in here the, the, the result of that. But hey, I've learned since then, you know? I've grown, and I'm sure you two will as well. It's just a matter of you. You just gotta do it. Don't be Thank scared. You. Like, I'm sure you guys got a lot of cool stuff to say and, and a unique take on the, the things that you're gonna be covering, so. Yeah, and if you don't have any um, conspiracy ideas that you like us to talk about, um, send us a uh, slide into our DMs. Cool. Have you looked into to QAnon at all since I've been mentioning that? I feel like I have a family member that I could just interview <laughs> at this point. That would be interesting. Say, wow. Why? And I'm the weird cousin? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. There you go. Sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. So yeah, so there's their Twitter, um, the Dark Thought Project, and then they, are, they have a, a TikTok as the young kids do. I am not on. I mean, I, I am on. I, I have a TikTok account. I have not. I've never posted a video to TikTok. Please go to our I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah. Stay, stay tuned for uh, the Kropotkin coming out later. This. No, I'm just kidding. So the Dark Thought Project. Dark Thoughts. I keep saying thought. It's Dark Thoughts Project. There's some thoughts. My dark thought is. Uh, Probably brings you to a totally different Christian sort of. Christian one. It's so fun. <laughs> Jesus and crap. So they're on the, the, the TikToks, and then they're also on the Instagrams. Hey, that's me. And if you'd like, feel free to follow my own personal Instagram, read at Krikon. Post a lot of cats. Oh, you're writing a book series? Yeah. Oh, what is your book series about? Tell us about that. Uh, dabbling in science fiction with inspirations from other genres like noir. Um, I read about I always love noir. queer superheroes. Cool. Yeah. Queer superhero, noir, science fiction. Is this set in present time, alternate time? What are, we, what are we talking about? Present. Present time? Yeah. Cool. Very cool. All right. Do you have a, do you have a, a working title for this yet, or is this just kind of... Right over? now, it's the Blondie the Bombshell series. Blondie the Bombshell. Do you have actual issues or books or anything out? Is it... Is there any physical form of this yet? Or? Uh, just brief notes on my um, whiteboard that I'll I mean, post frequently. That, that, that's my novel as well. Well, it's and frequently. Note, notes in my Evernote app, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but someday. Uh, I'll have material that you can look there at you someday. Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I love writing. Don't do it nearly enough. I'm sure you could probably relate to that as well. Pretty much every writer can relate to that. That's my cat. Just That's your cat? What's your cat's name? It's Alphaba. A what, a what now? Alphaba. If you're, um, Alphaba? If you're familiar Wizard with the... Uh, yeah, Wizard of Oz. Look at Witch of the West. Her name was Alphaba? Yeah. I read that entire series of books. All freaking seven of those books. Did you I don't remember that. Wicket? Huh? Wicket? Wicket? Yeah. Basically, I'd say a fan fiction that became a Broadway smash hit. I did not read Wicked. No. Yeah. I was totally done with, with Frank L. Baum after that series. So I have not tried to return to that after that point. Well, if you want to see uh, Linda and Alphaba in college, yeah. Yeah, hey, why not? Check let, it let, out. Let's go on that route, sure. Defying gravity changed us all. Have you read any of the other in, in Frank Baum's actual series of Oz books? I'm afraid of the actual Wizard of Oz. Oh, okay. Have you read the original book no. itself? Oh, you should at least read that one. That one's pretty good. But then they just kind of, it's, it's a strange like stair step thing where it's like, the first one, his best work for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then a little better, and then, uh, and then it just goes up and down all the way down until we're getting into the shaggy man with his heart magnet where he can make every he can make anyone love him as long as you hold on to the heart magnet and the dumbest character i have ever read in any literature ever button bright whose big line and everyone is i don't know I, I don't know what's going on i don't know and then he just disappears and everyone has to go find him for like two chapters and he's like oh i just i got lost I don't 
it's literally the entire character. And yet, so apparently, people sent letters to him. Oh, I love Bright. Oh, he was my favorite character. It's like, what was going on with children in this era? Was Maybe there... you just weren't afraid they were right. What's that? Maybe they wanted to run away? Yeah, apparently he was the, the, the mascot for lost children everywhere and all this stuff. But, oh, just the most insufferable character. And there was a lot of characters that weren't that much better. But yeah, but he did have his gems, you know. Ozma, great character. Um, it was like a very, it seemed like a very early trans allegory, actually. Uh, living as a boy turned out to be the princess and, and later queen of Oz. Can I sidebar your sidebar? Yeah, um, yeah. I l was it yesterday? I learned about um, Bugs Bunny. Hmm. Um, like the history of Bugs Bunny and how um, his creator made him, I'm saying him, but a gender fluid character. And he oh, was really? really proud that um, Bugs Bunny became like an icon within the trans community. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, and. Um, I had no idea. I didn't even know he was an icon within the trans community. Yeah, and sense. he was um, inspired by. Uh, Norse mythology tricksters, so Loki. And if you think of Loki, I guess being, that makes sense. Yeah. Loki, yeah. Loki themselves were gender fluid. Yeah, could tra change into a woman, change into a horse. Loki's a fascinating character. I actually mm -hmm. like the, the Norse mythology. I recently read the the, um, the Poetic Eda, which is like the. I guess the, the most complete version of all the Norse mythology. It was pretty good. At least parts of it were. Some parts were. Not so much. But, yeah. Interesting stuff. Very cool. I love Bugs Bunny. Yeah. Okay. Very. I, I'm excited about Space Jam. I feel like no one else is. But. Yeah. Who's. Is, is, what, is it Tony Hawk in the new Space Jam? Or am I completely off on that? Maybe Tony Hawk's in a basketball movie? Um, no. That would be I think that's LeBron James. Oh, LeBron James is, is taking Same. over the Michael Jordan? Yeah. Okay. I think what I'm thinking of is... There's a podcast I listen to where they... They're remastering um, Tony Hawk's first, like, pro skater games. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, but there, I was going to say there's this, this podcast that I listen to where... What the heck is it called? I don't remember. Um, but basically they take very basic sketches and then they just make an entire movie script out of it. Oh. It's really good. I can't think of it. It's been a while since I listened to it. And they and they reimagined Space Jam as Tony Hawk being the protagonist. So, I'd watch it. Yeah. Like he was trying to save his skate park but it had to be in a certain number of days and they had to win a skating competition or something. Mm -hmm. It was good. What is that called? Dang it. Now it's going to bother me. I'll put it up in the show notes if I can remember. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's that's about all we have to cover there. If the, unless there's anything else you want to well, bring thank up. you for yeah. having me on. This You're has been welcome. enlightening and also fun. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I hope you go back and check out some of the earlier, much more interesting chapters um, that we've covered. Because <laughs> this is just, man... This is not the place to enter this book. Sure. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I haven't read the agricultural chapter, but I don't have real high hopes for the way it, it wraps it up. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. This is one of my favorite uh, books. It's one of the things that inspired me most into anarchy and leftism and all this stuff. But uh, it's just kind of fizzling out at the end here. Maybe I've just been reading it for too long. And I'm just, thinking, oh, we've already passed the good ideas. But anyway. I am going to go ahead and raid you guys out into another channel. I'm going to hand you over to Ali Osher, a really great leftist streamer. He comes on, yeah, he comes into the, the chat from time to time here as well. Cool guy, uh, likes to cover a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of American politics, but he does all sorts of stuff. Anyway, enjoy Ali Osher. Have a great night, everybody.